You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I'm going to offend a lot of English football hooligans here, but I think Eastern European hooliganism is real football hooliganism. Getting smashed with a big fat belly and doing 15 lines and like glassing some 18 year old, which we've seen with like a lot of old school football hooliganism in England. When like I was in prison at one point with like ISIS guys, like actual like ISIS guys from Chechnya that were like getting deported the same way we were. And you know, we ate lunch next to them. I mean, they're my enemy, I'm their enemy, they hate me. In fact, they wanted to like kill us. Started kind of shutting down their own areas and the police moved in, started shooting kids, you know, like actually shooting kids, um, many unarmed as well. Like there's evidence, like video footage of them just shooting unarmed kids. And as we're going in, there's a guy just getting wheeled out on a stretcher, just covered in blood, dying, like coughing up. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I was like, we're gonna get killed. Some of the um, guards as well, like said, like, if I see you in the field, I'll kill you, you know what I mean? Essentially, they believe in human sacrifice. It was started here in Britain and people, you know, they've influenced several, there's been several order of nine angle killings across the world now, especially in the last five years. There was two human sacrifices in Russia last year. They actually caught the people for it. Been my own, and today's <laughs> guest we've got Jake Hanrahan. Hanrahan, good yeah, man. Yeah. Your Irish name, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Granddad's uh, granddad's name is from Limerick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So journalist, documentary maker. I think your stuff's great, man. Like Thanks, you've travelled all around the world: war zones, mm. Ukraine, Turkey, Iran, Iraq. Iraq, like, yeah, yeah. Like so many. Yeah, you've been in prison in Turkey. Like, yeah, yeah. People don't realise the extent of what goes into journalism. People just think it's a piece of piss, but. Mm man like yourself putting yourself in the war zone probably getting paid buttons risking his life for probably something that you love or else you wouldn't fucking do it do you know what i mean so first and foremost thanks for coming on yeah cheers mate. thanks for having me really appreciate mm -hmm. it yeah how's life anyway yeah it's all right i can't complain you know what i mean i mean i'm definitely feeling like the uh the government <laughs> you know what i mean my uh, energy bills just went up from like 70 quid to over 200 only like overnight without change so yeah that's stressful but um yeah things are good yeah good, can't mate. Complain, yeah. before we get into everything i always go back to the start of my guests get a bit of understanding mm -hmm. about you where you grew up and how it all began mm -hmm. yeah so um i'm from uh the east midlands the north ants anyone if you know where northampton is you know where it is um very just basic normal background you know what i mean i always say because <laughs> so many journalists went to private school and are very rich definitely weren't me <laughs> you know what i mean we, we weren't like that um you know i grew up very normal means um and then i mean you know i did school but i didn't really it was a very bad school the whole town like the whole area was very like it's a shithole to be honest with you you know i love it i love where i'm from it's like it's our shithole but it's a shithole you know what i mean anyone from the area that goes where are you from you're carrying like, oh shithole you know what i mean it's like yeah it is but it was a good place i think it was it's a good it's in a good part of the country it's like it's it's an hour from London, you know. It's like two hours from the north. It's it's a weird mix, a very weird different culture, you know, yeah. which I think was really good to kind of grow up around. Um, very rough, very kind of cruel at times, you know, kind of lifestyle and you know way way people live there. But it, it was a good start, I think, in a way. So yeah, so so I grew up there. Didn't really do very well at school. Left at sixteen, and I mean, I just went straight into like working, doing like labouring because I had no qualifications. I still have no qualifications on paper. But yeah, so I went into doing stuff like that. I worked at um, like a Muay Thai boxing gym, which was basically like kind of saved my life, I think. You know what I mean? Like I, was, I wasn't a bad kid really, but I was just like, just, you know, up to no good, thinking you're like the big man, you know what I mean? And clearly wasn't, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then started going to the Thai boxing gym and was like, oh, like I'm a little guy, <laughs> you know, I'm nobody. These are like real people. And, you know, that really taught me like, I don't know, respect and discipline. And you end up around like, all different people, you know what I mean? Like every different walk, walk of life. Like it was a very explicitly like, you know, respect was very much a big thing at our gym, you know, no racist, none of that nonsense, but like a very tough, serious people, you know what I mean? So we really liked that. That was always a good scene for me. Just worked there and then, yeah, laboring, warehouse, like worked in a suit shop, worked in a like, you know, telemarketing, like every job you can think of. But the whole time I was reading, 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 because um, my granddad was just like, look, you're good at, you know, I was always good at English. 
writing and stuff like that. And I was reading the whole time. That's one thing my granddad said, like, you know, he, I mean, he basically like brought me up to be honest, him and my grandma, to be honest, in, in many ways, I feel. And, you know, he always said like, no matter what you're doing, even if you're, you know, you've dropped out of school, you've messed up college, I left college, I did this. He said, at least just keep reading, you know, always keep reading, keep writing, doing what you're doing. So I did that. And I got to a point where I was like, I was like, you know what? Like, maybe I want to be a reporter. Like, I want to be a journalist. I'm reading these books by a journalist. I'm like, I want to do this. I think I can. Which was like, I thought that's so cocky of me to think at the time. But I thought, no, why not? So I just started like learning things, like just through the internet, really, like making contact with other kind of young reporters as well that I saw coming up through like Twitter and stuff like that. And there was a lad from my area, uh, JP. He runs Complex Mag now in the UK absolute legend like he happened to be from my area and he'd already done the thing gone out and he was like a music reporter and he kind of hit me up and he was like oh i've seen you like like i know you like uh, i see what you're doing you're trying to do things you're like i can help so he really helped me out and then before i knew it like i guess you know i was like I, had, I was decent enough at writing for people to be like oh who's this lad you know what i mean so then that got out there um i got a big piece in the guardian when i was quite quite young i was like 22 something like that and from there, people started noticing me. And yeah, I mean, I could go on forever, but ultimately I got my job at Vice when I started doing documentaries when I was 24. And that's when really, you know, everything took off. Then I never had to go back to, um, you know, laboring or whatever yeah. I was doing, you know. How did you get the job at Vice? Yeah, so I, I saw, so I, I was writing for Vice. I was writing articles for them and I liked it. You know, I still like a lot of what they do. I'm not, I don't think they went down a very good direction, but you know, it was a very, at the time it was like amazing. It was like real big impact doing their own thing and like really making a mark. And I was writing for them and they were giving me like great like opportunities that I weren't getting anywhere else. Cause they were just like, oh, you know, other places were too stuffy. It didn't really fit my kind of journalism. You know what I mean? It was very like rough underground type stuff. So Vice really gave me that kind of, like they gave me the opportunity. And then I saw Vice News started. I saw an advert for it. And they were like, oh, you know, we're doing this, this, and this war and stuff like that. And I thought that's everything I like about Vice without the stuff I don't like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was like, I have to work there. I must work there. So I contacted the editor that I was writing for. I was like, look, you've got to give me the email address of whoever this is running it. There was a guy, Kevin Sutcliffe, and he was like a new guy um, that was working for them. And he was just like brilliant. And basically I just bugged him, bugged him. I was like, look, I want to come and work for you. Here's work I've done before. And he said, all right, like, have you got ideas? I said, yeah, I got ideas. He said, all right, come then. And I was like, at the time I was so broke that like, I think I had to like borrow some money from my grandma to get the train from, from the Midlands to, to London. And I got there and I got to the office. I was like, oh, we got a meeting. And he was like, oh, I forgot. Sorry, like I've got to go. I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> so I, he said, oh, I'm going to be like three hours, like come another day. And I thought, nah, man, forget that. So I just waited and waited and waited. And he come back. And he's a bit like, what are you doing here sort of thing? And I was like, you said, wait. And he was like, I think he thought like, all right, like this kid's a bit weird or like at least he's trying, you know what I mean? So he said, all right, come on, 10 minutes. I'll give you, you know, like we'll do the thing. Pitch some, pitch some ideas to him. And he was like, all right, you know, this is good. And then I went back up uh, to the Midlands, didn't hear anything. I was working away on my day job and like writing on the weekend. And then they just rang me once. I remember they were like, are you going to work for us then? Like that. And I was like, really? And they were like, yeah, what's your day rate? Now at the time I was so broke, I said a hundred pound a day. And that was more money I'd ever been on ever. <laughs> I thought that was amazing at the time. And they're like, okay, hundred pound a day. I was like, wow, I was like hundred pound a day. So they were like, off you come. Like, so start next week. So walked straight out of the job and then went down there. And I, I, they brought me on as like a researcher. And I did like a, a video test thing. Like, you know, like you're on the camera and they ask you things and da da da. And then within like two weeks, they were like, we want you to do documentaries. And I, like, this is unheard of in journalism. You know, at the BBC, you'd be making tea for like 10 years before you get, even get to talk to a producer. And within like two weeks, they'd like put me on a project. Within two months, I was out making my first documentary. And for me, it was just, it was surreal, man. And even coming to London and like, the Midlands is not like, you know, it's not like some island off of like, you know, Scotland in like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not the middle of nowhere. But it was, it's a very different scene, especially then, you know, like you're talking almost 10 years ago now. And it was just, man, it was surreal. It was so cool, you know. What was your first documentary you done? First doc I did, I made a doc about um, like very militant Swedish anti-fascists. Um, and there's, there's, well, I mean, we'll see it now. I mean, there's a big like far right kind of party just been voted in in Sweden. They have like, despite their kind of, we're all liberal, they have like quite a serious like far right network. 
and in Sweden in in Sweden I yeah thought Sweden was all fucking ah uh, man Kill and cam no nah, no nah, they got like like there was a bombing a few years ago and everything yeah yeah it's like you they you don't hear about it so much mm -hmm. but it's quite serious and so on the other side of that there were like anti fascists that were like going into their homes like raiding them attacking them whatever whatever one of them got stabbed so we had access to film with them like you know why are you doing this what's the thing what's the thing and that did really well I remember it hit like a hundred thousand views in like the first day which back then was like really good. And I was, I was at the gym at the time and my mate like texted me from America, like one of the other Vice guys. I was like, dude, it was Danny Gold, legend, a good friend of mine. So like, dude, he got a hundred thousand views already. And I was like, I don't know what, is that good? Is it bad? Like, he's like, it's really good. So off the back of that, um, they, Vice were like, right, you're like, you're a reporter now for us, like Vice News, off you go. And then pff, man, just like, it was crazy. I remember like, I'd only left the country like, I don't know, like six or seven times before that on like family holidays. Like, you know, like it was fun, you know, like my grandma and granddad mm -hmm. took me to Italy when I was a kid. Been to Spain like several times with my mum and my sisters and that. But I'd never been to like, you know, out in the world like that. I'd always wanted to and I'd read so much about things like this. So for me, it was just like, wow, it was mm -hmm. like amazing, you know. What other stuff did you do for advice? Mostly war and conflict. So, you know, either like riots across Europe or again, I covered a lot of the Kurdish issues, um, particularly like you mentioned earlier in Southeast Turkey. So like, you know, Kurdish rebels essentially mm -hmm. against their government fighting them. I was really the guy that I wanted to make a niche for myself because I was no one there really at Vice News, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And I knew that I was like, I'm just this guy. Um, I think they just wanted someone a little bit different because they had a lot of like posh reporters. I'm obviously not very posh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I was like, okay, I don't want to be that guy that's like, oh yeah, like let's get the working class kid on, you know, crime in wherever. I wanted to be like, no, I want to do my own thing. I don't feel like I should be shoeboxed into this because I sound like this or sound like whatever. Unfortunately, that, made, that gave me a real complex. And I was like really trying to talk like really really proper, <laughs> you know what I mean? Which when I look back, I'm like, that was so dumb. Like, who cares, you know what I mean? But anyway, like they they kind of, my boss, Kevin was great. And he gave me the opportunity. He was like, look, I know you don't want to do, look, put it this way, advice at the time, I had like four people within the first couple of weeks be like, do you want to do a football hooligan documentary? Why? <laughs> like, why me? You know, I was like, no, I don't. Um, which is ironic because now I've done one. But at the time, you know what I mean? I was like, no, I don't. And my boss was great. He was like, I get it. He's like, you don't want to be put into that. Like, I'm going to give you the opportunities to do what you want to do. And so I, I found a niche for myself um, reporting on like guerrilla groups. You know what I mean? Like, not like your regular army, not like British army. You're talking like, you know, militant groups, terrorists, whatever. You know what I mean? And I found that really more interesting. Separatists, um, you know, irregular forces. I wasn't so interested in like, this guy has got a T whatever tank. For me, I don't care. Like it doesn't, but that doesn't really interest me. What interests me is like, oh, this young lad somewhere has worked out to make a bomb using like, I don't know, <laughs> a sieve. You know what I mean? Some mm -hmm. stuff he's found under the kitchen sink. So that to me was always way more interesting. So yeah, man, they, they let me just kind of go with it. And through that, I covered a lot of the Kurdish issues. Again, like ended up getting arrested for that in Turkey, which was a nightmare, but it was still all a good experience. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So the Kurdish, <clears throat> That's, is that Iranians? So, yeah, so it's split up between four parts. So you've got, it's split over Iran, Iraq, uh, Southeast Turkey, and Northern Syria. Mm -hmm. So they don't have their own country, obviously. Well, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean, yeah. like borders. Mm -hmm. So each each part has its own separatist group, militant group, mm -hmm. independence, rebels, whatever you want to call them. Um, and we at the time were doing Southeast Turkey because it was when ISIS, the war with ISIS was really, really booming. And they were fighting the Kurds in, in northern Syria, which is right on the border with Southeast Turkey. And at the time, the government in, in Turkey was, you know, trying to have a ceasefire with the militant group in their country, trying to make peace. So the Kurds were like, okay, well, let us cross the border to fight and like join our brothers and sisters that are fighting there because ISIS is killing them. And the Turkish government was kind of like, well, no, they're Kurds. So, you know, essentially they didn't really mind <laughs> that they were getting killed. Okay, they don't like ISIS, but they were like, well, you know, enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of vibe. You know what I'm saying? So that's how it happened. And through that and many other issues, I mean, it's been going on for like, like 50, 60 years, you know, the resistance there. But through that, there was like a flare up amongst the youth. Um, and you're talking like 16, 17, 18 year old kids in the urban areas, like very deprived areas, suddenly like, right, we're not having this anymore. 
started kind of shutting down their own areas and the police moved in, started shooting kids, you know, like actually shooting kids, um, many unarmed as well. Like there's evidence, like video footage of them just shooting unarmed kids. So I was like, all right, let's go. You know what I mean? Mm. What's the plan as what's the plan of attack when you go to these places, these war zones? Has there got to be safety there or is it just a case of book your tickets and go and wing it? How do um, you plan it out? I mean, it's, it's never safe, you know what I mean? Yeah. But there's ways to make it safer, if you know what I'm saying. So there's a lot of reporters just be like, it's happening, get the ticket. Which to be honest, when I was younger, I was reckless like that. I didn't really, I was like, if I die out doing this, who cares? Which I think is mad. Like that's actually not good. That doesn't make you a good reporter to be fearless. You need fear, you know what I mean? Because I was always like, get to the front, you know, as close to the action, as close to whatever. And yeah, I do still believe you do need to get close because you'll never understand the combat fully unless you're like close, close, but you don't need it. Like, you know, you don't want to do it for yourself only. You know what I'm saying? So I think there's ways of making it safer. So for example, if we're like, okay, for that story, I was like, okay, there's an uprising in Southeast Turkey, um, you know, Kurdish teenagers with like grenades and, and, and rifles, but you know that they're, they're not like, they're not like hood rats. They're not roadmen. <laughs> you know, if you turn up, they're not going to be like, give me your phone. They're not them. They're good people. They're in a bad spot. So already it's a lot easier to talk with them. It's not like I want to go and hang out with ISIS. <laughs> Obviously, they're going to cut my head off. It's, it's very different. So, you know, through various different people that I knew already in the Kurdish community, I kind of reached out and be like, hey, do you know any of these? And say, yeah, actually, yeah. I'm fucking hell, my cousin's actually fighting down there. Okay, can you put me in touch? Yeah, no, no problem. So we start talking. I say, look, I get what you're doing. I want to come and tell this story. No one else is covering it. And I know that I think there was like three lads under 18 had been shot dead in the street um, before anyone covered it outside of Turkey. So I was like, let me go and do it. And, you know, they were kind of like, mm, all right, like, you know, if you come here, here's a number, ring us, you know, blah, blah. But obviously I don't speak the language. I don't speak Kurdish. I don't speak Turkish. So then you need a fixer on the ground. You need someone who does, who can kind of... Interpret. Yeah, exactly. Interpret, but also be the middleman. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more than just, it's, I say this to people, it's not Google Translate. Anyone can Google Translate. You need an interpreter, like you said, you know, someone that can interpret the situation, interpret the language, explain what's going on. You need someone with real street smarts, real savvy, you know what I mean? So if you find a, a good fixer, they're worth their weight in gold. I mean, I don't even, fixer isn't even the right term. Like often in our documentaries now with my platform, with Popular Front, we say to them like, look, do you want to be called a fixer or like, um, like field producer? Because they're helping you produce the thing. They're going, right, today we, you know, you say this what I want. And then they go, okay, let me make it happen. So we need a good person like that. And then, yeah, then it's literally a case of get the ticket over you go. And then generally you'll meet up with somebody and then your kind of life is in their hands, you know. How do you build up trust with them? Just by be being truthful with them or yeah. because you could be anybody you yeah, could be yeah. working for mm. the enemy or whoever they're fighting like how do they know yeah no it's a, it's, a, it's a good question because it's it is hard like it's not always that easy now at the stage i'm at in my career now like not to be big-headed but i have a i think i have a good of enough reputation as being like honest that it's it's kind of all right like even people that don't like me that hate me i don't think they would say i'm a liar you know what i mean i don't think they say they can say my maybe they'll see i mean they'll come up with fucking anything but i think generally it's like yeah like okay he's a dick but we get what he's saying <laughs> you know what i mean or whatever that which is fine by me i don't care but obviously when you first start out and also even a different crowd it's like difficult like what do i show them you know what i'm saying so i think i think the way to build up trust is yeah you just have to be honest and th there's a real you can't be lying to people like that. You can't be like, you know, if, if I, you know, I've done work into like fucking militant neo-Nazis and I've had to talk with them and meet with them. Some of them, like obviously not the ones that are doing it, but like, you know, people may be associated that are like, oh yeah, you know what? They've gone too far. I want to help you out. And I straight up tell them, I'm like, look, I can have a conversation with you, but I fucking hate you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I hate everything you believe in. And you know, on the other side of a front line, we'd be enemies, whatever. But right now in this situation, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. And to be honest, most people appreciate that. You know what I mean? Like even when, when like I was in prison at one point with like ISIS guys, like actual like ISIS guys from Chechnya that were like getting deported the same way we were. And you know, we ate lunch next to them. I mean, they're my enemy. I'm their enemy. They hate me. In fact, they wanted to like kill us, but there's a you know it's real life is not the internet and sometimes mm -hmm. you have to make like very uneasy like compromises to get the trust because you're not trying to be friends you know it's like you said you're not you, you want trust you want to be honest you're not trying to make friends you're trying to make a, a report and you want to make it happen so i guess, I guess yeah it's, it's it's a bit of a dance you know what i mean mm -hmm. but it's about being honest i think how did you get the jail in turkey 
How to get to jail? Yeah. Oh man! So we'd we'd been there twice before filming with this um, militant group, like the Urban Youth Movement. Um, the militant group being the PKK, like very long, long standing of like you know resistance, militancy. Turkey would say terrorism to the state and whatever. Like very very skilled guerrilla fighters. You know, like I mean, for forty fifty years, Turkish government has been like they're on their last legs. And like another 10 years later, they, they, you know, they've got like a thousand new recruits and, and still fighting the war or whatever. So I was in Southeast Turkey. And at the time, the first time I went, it was a little bit less authoritarian than it is now. I mean, a lot of people don't realize while they're fucking getting drunk in Bodrum that, you know, Turkey is the second largest jail of journalists um, worldwide, just under China. And that's not just foreign reporters or Kurdish reporters, that's Turkish reporters as well. You know what I mean? Um, and oh, yeah, that. deeply authoritarian government. Can't um, speak out against them. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely. I, I, there's a case in a city in Southeast Turkey where they actually changed the traffic lights because they were um, yellow, red, green. And that's the Kurdish colors. <laughs> so they changed the traffic lights. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very extreme. Um, and I, you know, I witnessed that firsthand. But when I first went there, there was like a reform going on, you know, and it wasn't so bad. You could report openly, not very, but a lot more open than you could. You know, they allowed the Kurdish communities to have their own flags and celebrate their culture. And then, you know, they had a ceasefire with the militant group, but then the Kurds, obviously, you know, they're smart people. They were in the politics now. And then they got elected into government. So they got past the threshold with it, like a... It wasn't just the Kurdish party. It was a lot of like Turkish leftists and liberals joined them as well because they, you know, they weren't against the government. There's a big difference between, you know, the state and the people. Um, so when they got into parliament, the government went, mm -mm. <laughs> they were like, fuck that, we can't let them have any power. Basically started a war in the Southeast. The ceasefire was off and it all kicked off again. So we filmed just before that happened and the youth were saying like, there's going to be a war here. We're already fighting. Then the war happened. Um, so I went back and essentially it was like a full blown war. It was, it, it was like Syria in Southeast Turkey. Like Southeast Turkey is very different to the rest of Turkey. If you've been to Istanbul, it's a beautiful city. Don't get me wrong, it's amazing. But Southeast Turkey is the total opposite. Southeast Turkey is more like hot Eastern Europe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or hotter Eastern Europe. Like it's very different, very, you know, um, deprived, you know, because most of the, well, a lot of the Kurds live there. It's Kurdish. They see it as like, well, the Kurds, it's their, their land, but like the Turks say it's a Kurdish area, but it's our land. You know what I'm saying? So it's whatever. It's like, you know, we always hear these stories all over the world. Um, so we went there and it was full scale war, like absolutely hectic. Like, you know, I mean, Turkey is NATO's second largest army. So you had um, NATO forces firing tanks into like little houses where literally teenage rebels were fighting. You know, it was, cr it was crazy, man. It was the maddest stuff. Um, I mean, no, I wasn't there for that. Like, I didn't see that specifically, but like we were there for a lot of it, like on the ground and it was just a war zone. And so we were there in that and we were, we were kind of behind enemy lines, if you like, you know, there was no other reporters there really, like one or two, but not really. And we were in the areas that the Kurds had full control over because some cities they'd completely taken control. Um, the military couldn't really take them. You know, the, the police were long gone. And so there we were okay. But then we moved to a city where, you know, we wanted to tell the story of the city that's in flux. So half of the city is under control of the Kurds. The other half is still under control of the Turkish state. And that's where we got arrested. And so one day we like, we were filming with these like militants and they were like firing a gun up the road and all this shit. We get back to the hotel and just police everywhere. Like, you know, armed police, get out of the car. I was like, oh, fucking hell, like, what's happening here? And I kind of knew immediately, um, I was like, this is bad. You know what I mean? Like, I knew the way the government was going. We were lucky. We were only in for like 11 days. I mean, it was like four different prisons, very brutal, max security prisons. Um, we were charged with being terrorists, which was madness to me. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, I'd never, I've never been a combatant in my life. Um, not like with weapons anyway, <laughs> you know what I mean? And firearms. So it was just madness to be like, well, we're terrorists. I was like, what? Like what? And basically they were saying that we're like propagandists for them. Because whatever. So yeah, so they threw us in prison. And yeah, that was just like a nightmare, man. It was like a dungeon. You know? Did anybody know that you were in jail over here? <sighs> well, luckily, I mean, at the time, I mean, I've got a lot of issues with Vice um, in the way they conduct themselves now and the content they put out. But that has nothing to do with the way they have helped us and continue to help us. They basically, as soon as they found out, like one of my mates like that I was filming with quickly just texted them like, we're getting arrested. And then they took our phones or whatever. 
And they just went like above and beyond. They did everything they could, like immediately got lawyers. Like one guy, um, Yoni, really nice guy, like flew over to like just be in Turkey while we were there, just so we had like, I mean, we barely were allowed like visits. But yeah, I mean, they did everything they could do. But essentially, I never forget, there was one time, like the first night we were, we were being taken in to the, like the cell and we had all this like money that Vice had given us for expenses because obviously there's a full blown fucking war going on. There's no ATM machine, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't just use the thing. And we got it all in small notes because it's a very poor area. You don't need a lot of like big notes there. And then for some reason, you know, obviously they're like, oh, you're paying these guys. And I was like, what? <laughs> like These guys are known for like, you know, doing all sorts of madness around the world to funnel money back to their organization to continue to fight. They certainly don't need like two grand from some like idiot reporters. But anyway, they were like, you're giving them money. I was like, bullshit, whatever. So he's like, I'm going to count all the money in front of you. I was like, all right, fine. So you guys count some money. I must have like just got the ass on. I was, like, I was like, this is bollocks. Like we have rights. Like what the fuck are you doing? Like we, we, you know what I mean? And he just said to me, you're Turkish now. And that's it. And basically he's kind of, uh, you know, he was inferring like, we'll do whatever we want. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't have rights anymore. And from then on, I realized like, all right, <laughs> like we were in real trouble. You know what I mean? Did you worry? Oh yeah, man, I was terrified. Like, I'm not going to pretend like, oh yeah, I was like brave. Like, nah, man, I was mad scared. Like, I was scared as anybody would be. It was me and like two of my best friends, luckily. It wasn't just two random people I worked with, like two like, of my closest friends I was in prison with. Um, Rasul, our like Kurdish interpreter, and my mate Phil, who was filming. So that was like really helpful. Yeah. And they'd arrested so many Kurds <laughs> that um, they, they put us in a solitary confinement cell but they didn't have enough cells. So they had to put like, so I was in the cell with with my friend, you know what I mean? My friend Phil and then Rizal was next to us so we could talk in and out the cell. So it could have been worse, you know, but we all made a pact. We were like, look, it's scary, but you know, we're going to pull through. We're going to get out of this. And we did, you know? Yeah, because it's Turkish. Obviously ISIS, Taliban, you see them fucking knives at the throat and exactly, taking yeah. hostages and yeah. ransoms. Like, did you know Turkey was, they weren't really known for killing journalists? Uh, well, one of the prisons, is... yeah, one of the prisons we were put in, the Abakir prison, if you just Google it, mm -hmm. it's known for being one of the worst prisons on earth. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was like, and we were in the Abakir when we were arrested, or Ahmed, and I was like, okay, I hope we don't go in there. Went to, went to court, got sent there. And as we're going in, there's a guy just getting wheeled out on a stretcher, just covered in blood, dying, like coughing up. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I was like, we're going to get killed. Some of the um, guards as well, like said, like, if I see you in the field, I'll kill you. You know what I mean? So I didn't think we'd get killed, but it wasn't a stretch at all. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh yeah, we could easily get killed here, you know, by accident, by accident, you know? So I was a little bit worried, but yeah, I mean, I knew it could be a lot worse. <laughs> you know, it wasn't ISIS. We, you know, it wasn't like Taliban or anything like that. But ironically, once we got into Diyarbakir prison after seeing this guy like coughing up blood, where we thought, oh, we're, we've had it. We get in there and all the guards were like really nice. They were like the loveliest guards. And they were like, hey, like once the, once the jailers left or the, the cops left, they were like, we're Kurdish. Like, we know you're not terrorists. <laughs> they were like, here's a kettle. They gave us a kettle. And we were like, oh, we'll be all right here. We, I remember my mate Phil was like, we could do a few months in here. Like, it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. Next day, Turkish cops turn up. They must have realized, I don't know, something. They were like, like this at the gate with a gun. And I was like, what the fuck? So then we got put in the back of uh, this weird, like, it's called a scorpion. It's like an armored vehicle, like cuffed like this. Like, you literally couldn't move. Like, your fucking knees under your chin. Eight hours in, like, the blistering heat. No food, no water. And they drove us from, yeah, eight hour drive from that part of the country, the Kurdish areas, to the very nationalist, like ultra nationalist area in Adana, which was, I mean, as soon as we got into prison there, you just immediately, the attitude changed. I mean, they put us in a holding room, but no joke, had blood. Everything was written in blood. And it was Ishit, which is ISIS in Turkish. So we realized, and Rizul, he can read it all, bless him. You know, he speaks Turkish, he speaks Kurdish. And he was like, fuck, he's like, we're in an ISIS prison. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> I was like, Jesus Christ. So basically they had said, we're terrorists. And they accused us of being both working with the PKK, so the Kurdish militant group, and uh, the jihadists, ISIS militant groups. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how? Because they hate each other. They're fighting each other. But I guess they did it so they could then put us in a very scary prison, probably to scare us. You know what I mean? But honestly, in the end, the jail is even in there. After like a day or two, you could tell they were like, we know, you know, they're not the core. They kind of, they kind of even said to us, like, kind of said, like, we know you haven't actually done anything. You know what I mean? And, and eventually the treatment got a lot better. And I remember, you know, they would even say to you, like, oh, it's nice to meet you. Like, you know, if you get deported, we hope you have a good time. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, yeah, fuck off, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it could have been a lot worse. What was it like when you get out? 
best feeling ever, man. Mm -hmm. Best feeling. I remember thinking like, you know, unfortunately where I grew up, like some of my, I know a few people that have like went to prison and stuff like that, like friends of mine, just through dumb stuff, you know, getting into trouble. And I always just thought like, I remember thinking, like, obviously I never want to go to prison, but seeing them when they get out, you know, you go and get them and whatever. And I thought, oh, that must feel great. And then I got to experience it in like the most extreme way possible. But like, ah, oh man, I remember we um we we come back and like it was like out of prison and we I remember we went down to um we we're in Brick Lane, me and my mate, we were like all like I'd lost like a stone in weight, like I got like some weird like bacteria in my stomach because we barely, you know, we didn't get much food, the conditions were disgusting. So we're all like like just ripped apart basically. Like so we went to go and get a haircut on Brick Lane. And when we me and Phil were sat there. And Razul was still in prison at this time. So he got out later, but he was still in there. So we're like, it's the best feeling to get out. But we're like, oh my God, our friend is still in there. So it's a very weird feeling, you know what I mean? But it did feel great to be out for that, you know, honeymoon period. And then you just get the press that your friend is in there. Um, but yeah, we sat there in Brick Lane and we're getting a I remember it was a hot day and we're just seeing every type of person you can think of. Like, you know, like London's very multicultural. It's very mixed, it's whatever. And I remember I was like, this is great. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, our country is fucked in many ways, but we've also got something really nice. And it gave me like a real, a new appreciation for like, you know, what we have. And I don't mean the government. I don't mean the state or monarchy. That's not my thing. I mean like the people, our neighbors, our people, our friends, you know what I mean? And I was just like, this is great. It's not, it was like to be in free, free, really like try and be free after like, I mean, imagine like two weeks almost, you can't even say things. You, you're constantly cuffed to your friend or whatever, you know what I mean? And everywhere you go, you can't understand someone's having to tell you you're a terrorist and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it was a lot of emotions, man, but it felt good, really good. How did Vice treat you once you get out? Great, yeah, They tell great. you to take some time off or is it straight back yeah, to work? Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they told us to take some time off. The first day we got there, we got put in a fancy hotel and me and Phil had never had lobster before. So we're like, fuck it, we're going to get lobster tonight. We're out of prison, like, went and got lobster. And that was crazy. Like, that was really nice. And then they kind of gave us like two weeks off. But then my boss was right. He's like, you need to get back out and do something. And I was like, you're right. Because, you know, you don't want to have like some weird fear. So we went to Estonia, which obviously there's no war going on there, but they were preparing. They got like, um, like a, a volunteer militia force of the, like a government militia, just in case Russia invades them. Um, and we made a film about them. And it was like, yeah, straight back in it. You know what I mean? And and also they did a lot to, because obviously Rizal was still in prison. So we did this campaign, Free Rizal. And we were like going to all these like fancy, it was ironic really, because before this, none of the kind of elitist journo people in the kind of, I call it journo world. Like I'm a journalist, don't get me wrong, but I don't like journo world. <laughs> I think the industry is, is, is corrupt and it thrives on nepotism. And, and anyway, it's a mess. And they never gave a shit about any of our work until we came out of prison. Then all of a sudden we're getting invited to the frontline club and we're getting taken, which they're good people, don't get me wrong. But you know, we're getting brought into all these like fancy do's. Um, and it, but it was, it was to meet, it was to meet like influential people. And we had this post, we'd always hold it up and like free resolve, like please like raise awareness. And every day, like Vice were like on it every single day, updating us. Um, and then eventually we just get a call. It was January 5th. And they're like, Rizal's out. We're like, what? Like, just released him for some reason. And they released him. Ironically, the guy, the judge that gave him, that said like, okay, we'll let you out, then himself was arrested and sent to prison. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, man. And um, we had a good lawyer. It was sad. One of our lawyers got shot dead, shot dead in the street. Uh, Tahir Elchi was like a famous kind of Kurdish lawyer. He was representing us. Then he got arrested. Um, for saying on TV about the militant group is not a terrorist group, a resistance, whatever. He got arrested and then he got shot dead in weird circumstances. So it was all a crazy situation. But honestly, like I can't fault Vice really. They really, really came out for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Stephen, like, why was your the other guy kept in longer? He's Kurdish, is my opinion. So he feels they feel as if he was working with. Well, no, yeah. they knew. I mean, even in court. They knew that, I mean, that's the thing. It's like a mirage. It's like, you know, they can see the terror threat over there. And when they get there, they very clearly, they're very, they like knew. We'd never, we'd, we're not terrorists. We're just reporters doing our job. You know what I'm saying? Like, we didn't help them. We didn't do anything. We just told their side of the story. We were in prison. I remember we were in prison. They were like, why are you filming them? I said, will you let us film with you? They were like, no. So there you go. Who do we film with then? <laughs> we film with them. You know what yeah. I mean? It's all right. Let's come on a ride along with you. We'll, we'll film the other side. They're like, no, no, no. It's all right. There you go. But like, the issue, you know, is that they didn't want, I guess, what was happening getting out there. I think that's the real issue. But he's Kurdish. He didn't have a powerful government to kind of bat for him. 
because again, like you know, their countries are all like split up, and they they don't have a they have an autonomous region in Iraq, but it's not a country country like in that sense. And I think it's a lot easier, unfortunately, for the Turkish government to be like, let those two white kids with red passports out, and then it will all go away. But we made sure it didn't go away. But I think that's the way the world works, unfortunately. Did the embassy or anything get involved? <sighs> a little bit. Nah, <laughs> not very much. <laughs> See when like if you why does like the British news only report some wars? Money, power, just their own agenda. Like, why is no no one in these sort of places? Well, it's not it's not mm. anything to do with Britain, but usually they're always in the mix somewhere. So why do they pick certain destinations to report on? I've been asking that for years, mate. <laughs> and that's why we started Popular Front, like my platform. We go anywhere, we don't care. You get a lot of like editors who be like, what's the what's the tie into Britain? And I'm like, do you think British people, do you think we only want to hear about British mm -hmm. stuff? We don't. Like, I mean, Netflix like everything if you look at the statistics what people from britain watch on netflix mostly has nothing to do with britain we're not that insular we're not americans <laughs> you know what i mean like unfortunately americans do like a lot of that but like people don't need that and and i would say well there isn't one it's a war happening but people still want to know yeah i'm not interested you know what i mean so unfortunately there's nothing like i mean you get a lot of conspiracy there's all this dark insidious uh, the people in power don't want this it's not that it's just like firstly a lot of the editors and producers working at the very big mainstream media companies are just inept a lot of them have got their job because their daddy knows someone in the media their mate went to the same private school as their mate and that's that's not a conspiracy any journalist in britain will tell you that even the ones that got there because of that will probably tell you that so you know that's how it is and a lot of people are very inept and they don't get they're just getting there. They're putting a job. They're getting paid a lot of money and they're like, oh, fuck, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. So they take the, the path of least resistance. So if someone says, I've got this story for you, ties into England, it's very easy. It's not that far away. Great. That's mm -hmm. easier for them. And then there's the other side of it where, I mean, you know, I, I had some arguments with some of my Armenian friends about this because Armenia was just invaded a couple months ago by Azerbaijan and there was a war a couple of years ago that I, I reported on unbelievable war crimes happening there, like mostly by the Azerbaijanis. Just, just, you're talking cutting soldiers, not like ISIS when it's soldiers, um, cutting off the heads of of people and playing football with it and filming it and uploading it, raping women, you know, stuff like awful, awful stuff. Barely got any attention. And I kind of said, I said, look, it's it, there's a why why the Ukraine why does Ukraine get so much more attention? It's like, well, it's unfortunately people in Europe are gonna care more about something closer to them, right? If a house is on fire on your street, you're gonna be like, oh shit, I don't want that spread into my house. If the fire is three roads away, who cares? <laughs> you know, it's sad, but it's not really, I think it's a lot of that. And obviously, you know, Europeans are more interested in what's close to them or that they see it as more of a threat or whatever. But then there is the other side of it where, you know, NATO and all that stuff gets involved. So a lot of journalists are very, you know, it, there's a weird thing where if you're like hardcore neoliberal in your political ideology, which is whatever, that's up to you, I don't care. But that is seen as like, that's fine, that's good reporting. If you always report the like hardcore neoliberal line, but then if you say go like left of that, you're biased now. It's like, what? Well, so if it's if it's your ideas, it's it's not. But when it's an idea that's different or you perceive it as different, then it's suddenly biased. So that's unfortunate. Um, so essentially, like Armenia is the example. So NATO says Armenia, this there's a disputed land between Armenia and Azerbaijan. They say that disputed land there, Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh, belongs to Azerbaijan. So then all the reporters go, okay, let's not read the history. Let's not look into what's happening. NATO says this, so then it's okay. And it's just life doesn't work like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's why I say you got to get on the ground. So there is a big problem with that. Um, Ukraine is a similar thing. There's a lot happening now in Ukraine, which uh, don't get me wrong, like I think Ukraine has every, um, you know, right to defend themselves from Russia. It's, it's a, uh, it's, it's, there's no, there's no like factual differences. It, it's, it's like an over invasion of a country. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, from my organization, we've raised thousands for units in Ukraine, you know, fighting Russia. However, there's a lot of reporters that will simply ignore some things because it's on the good guy's side. And that's wrong. That's not life and that's not truth. You know that's what I mean? It's not good journalism. It's not good journalism, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's PR. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a lot of reporters doing that right now. It's like anybody in Russia will support Russia and anybody in Ukraine will support Ukraine. But is that where you can see that when the agenda comes in from the news, people then supporting and sending money all to Ukraine, but not really seeing the picture why Russia try mm. to invade Ukraine? Especially with the thing with NATO. Can you Do you know the full details like, to kind of explain why Russia invaded mm. Ukraine? Because I was speaking to a man who was obviously talking about NATO and how they'd made an agreement, but 
They then went against it and Russia were, I don't know, NATO were getting closer apparently to Russia yeah, yeah. and then Russia started fighting like, do you know what they, well, there, there's a story? I know what you're talking about and honestly, that's bullshit. There's a lot of contrarians mm -hmm. who've never been to war um, and they go, well, Russia is their right to do this. Go to war, go to the ground and see women's families destroyed when they pick up their children in pieces in bags because Russia decided to go in and bomb the fuck out of them. Do you think anyone on the ground is going, well, we deserve this, NATO did this. That for me is a, an online talking point and it's not something I get in, I, mm -hmm. I detach myself from it because it's not real life. No one on the ground fighting a war gives a shit about 20 tweet threads by some fucking alleged leftist contrarian like that scumbag Jimmy Dore or whatever them guys, you know what I mean? Who's reality, that? Uh, he's just like some like lunatic that's like basically thinks it's good that Russia is like massacring children literally <laughs> because NATO bad. You know what I mean? I think NATO is fucking useless, and I, I think they're deep. Then I don't think they are objectively deeply corrupt as is the EU. But I'm glad we have NATO <laughs> because that's how life works. You don't always get to bat for your favorite football team in life. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of these contrarians are seeing war as a football match. That's not how it is. And and the thing is, well, NATO got too close to Russia. Well, well, Russia has made NATO stronger than ever. So what? Like it doesn't make any sense. So so then to invade and put yourself even closer to them, it doesn't make sense. Essentially, Russia has had this issue since the revolution. There was a pro-Russian government in Ukraine. The people rose up, fought it off because they were like, we don't want this anymore. Again, contrarians, people that have never been to Ukraine, never been to the front line, will also tell you that was a NATO-backed coup. The way they work is anything that doesn't fit with my ideology is a NATO-backed coup. Anything that fits with my ideology is real. You know what I mean? And it's the same on the other side as well. You know, you get a lot of the like very pro-NATO fanboys, they'll do the exact same thing. But that was a uh, uh, that was not a NATO back coup by any stretch. Let me tell you now, people died. You know what I mean? It's very serious, um, and no one was was out there rallying them to do it. It's you know, Ukrainians are very real people. They're very smart. They're very tough people, and they have their own agency. It's the same when you see in Iran, like oh, it's the CIA. Maybe the CIA is involved, whatever. But are you trying to tell me Iranians are not humans? They don't have their own feelings. If someone steps on your head you're going to be like, get off my head. You don't need the CIA to come and tell you, you need to get that foot off your head. You just do it, right? So the, the revolution happened, you know, the pro-Russian government is chased out and now Russia has no influence in Ukraine. Putin is made to look like a bit of a mug. And essentially over years now, he's built himself back up to go like, all right, you want to kick us like, oh, we'll fucking come for you. I mean, if you just go and look at Russian TV right now, so... Ironically, they were saying it's a denazification of Ukraine, which is very ironic because per capita, and we just did a long podcast on this, Russia has sent more fascist groups, openly fascist and aligned to the Kremlin, to fight in the war than Ukraine has. Every country has a problem with right-wing lunatics, you know what I mean? And whatever lunatic, it is what it is. But that's not what it is. So now they've dropped that because it's very clearly been proven bullshit. On the mainstream news in Russia now, they're calling it a de-Satan de de satanification or whatever you're saying it so now they're saying like everyone in ukraine is a satanist and that's why they're doing it and then you'll get some fucking contrarian on on twitter it's like actually this is why they're doing it it's like their actual government is saying it so russia says we're coming in to be an imperial force we want to take over you we don't believe ukraine exists and fuck your heritage fuck your culture the soldiers do the same putin says the same and then some guy on twitter is like actually this is why they did it. It's like, bro, Putin just said this is why they did it. It's actually really clear. But people want to muddy the waters because they see it as a football match. And I'm sure people, people say to me all the time, oh, you're for this, you're for that. I'm like, no, I don't give a shit, mate. I don't, oh, oh is, uh, uh, do I seem pro-NATO now? Do I seem pro this now? Oh, well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I'm not losing any sleep about it. I've been there. I've seen it. And politically, I don't care about NATO. I don't care about like all of this shit. All I care about is like, if you're stepping on someone's head, that's bad. And I think yeah. that's what it is, you know? What do you think about war on the whole? <sighs> I mean, I think it's just like a natural part of human life, unfortunately. I don't believe that there could ever be you know, I, mean, I remember um, uh, <laughs> I used to know this guy. He said, oh, if we didn't have any religion, we'd have no wars. So I make people fight over bits of turf. Like, you know what I mean? There is no stopping it. You know, monkeys in the wild fight for like their favorite tree or whatever. Like, I just think, unfortunately, war is like a big part of it. 
of human nature and governments and businesses, um, huge corporations have realized that, oh, we can make a lot of money doing this. No, I don't believe there's like some big like, you know, octopus going like, ah, move the chess piece here, move the chess piece there. That will start the war there. I think anyone that is on the ground and sees a front line very quickly realizes that it doesn't work like that. It would, be, it would be fucking impossible. I think anyone that has that idea that like, yeah, the Illuminati did this. I said, okay, come, I will take you to the front and show you what is going on. They'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> like mm -hmm. this is a absolute shit show. You know what I mean? Everything's a mess. People are dead, whatever. It's not like that. But there is certainly without a doubt, like people benefiting massively. The US government benefits, like look at Iraq, benefited so much from, uh, I think Dick Cheney made like a billion from like the Iraq war. You know what I mean? Like, and and I think as well the the real saddest part of it is like, I mean it, it's it's rich people like in the government. It's not their kids that die in the wars. You know what I mean? It, it's normal people. Like I mean, if you look at the Iraq War, I mean I think something like a million people in Britain came out on the streets to say like, no, we don't want to enter this war. Tony Blair went, all right, fuck you. And then the same kind of people that marched, a lot of their kids ended up dying in the war. And it's like there is no. There's no, there's no yeah, like, that's oh, what I think, but there's these, no sense. Yeah, yeah, it's these fuckers that should be going to war. Like, I think you said Tony, son. Yeah, yeah, Tony Blair, like, he, he was looking for, what is it, weapons of mass destruction and there was no weapons Hilarious. found. Like, yeah. And the amount <laughs> where's of people Wally, where's that died, Wally, yeah, yeah, like, was that not for the poppy fields and the oil and the fucking, Absolutely. the gold and, like, the darkness around it all, I don't know all the ins and outs, like, we can all be conspiracy mm. theories, we can all talk about mad shit, but, when you actually look at the key points, and like you say, there's been wars for hundreds of years, yeah. millions of years, who fucking knows? Yeah, it's only yeah. history books that tell us that. But when you actually go into depth of it, in all in honesty, I would I would wish no wars on the planet, but there fucking is. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The same as Britain, they've invaded nearly every country on the yeah, planet. We're, 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 we're like the most the ruthless, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, really yeah. most fucking yeah. manipulative, ruthless, greedy. There's like, a reason my surname hasn't got an O in it anymore. Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> it's just... See when you get into these war zones, see when you go front line, are you, do you then thrive on that? Do you buzz off bullets and guns? Because I interviewed a sniper and it was mad. He, he's battling now that he's not in a war zone, but he would rather be in the war zone because he would feel calmer. Yeah. Do yeah. you then thrive off a buzz where you're not just doing it for a job, but your adrenaline's so high from it? it yeah, it's a tricky one, that. I mean, I've never been involved in like... I don't know. But like just I'm going not, to a war zone, whether you're fucking standing just, by yeah. or not, is, is adrenaline rushing definitely, itself. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Not just knowing where you're, because once you've been in prison, you're always, your paranoia is going to go through the roof. Oh, your senses are yeah, going to go yeah, through the roof. Yeah. So when you're going there, knowing a possibility, even going through customs, you're thinking, am I going to get yeah, fucking, yeah. Like everything then becomes adrenaline. It does, going yeah. to the airport, getting off the plane, going to the hotel, then going to work. Mm. Like, everything just becomes an adrenaline. Like, how do you then, I, but I do buzz off it, but I buzz off it in a different way. Like anyone that tells you like frontline is not exciting is just lying. Like if you don't find it, I mean, some people go frontline, they're terrified, they never go again. They didn't find it exciting. I've been several times in many different countries. There is a level of it that of course it's exciting. I mean, it's life or death. It's exciting. But I don't buzz off that as much as I do buzzing off of just being in a completely unusual situation. Like everyday life is boring right you get up you make your coffee i walk my dog i do this I do, don't get me wrong i love my job and i like running my business and i don't have to work for anybody whatever but there's nothing like being out there meeting new people and being like whoa what the fuck is this whoa why is that car flipped upside down you know what i mean what what you guys used to be like mechanics now you're building tanks and bombs like that is what i buzz off not so much the action and all the, the adrenaline of nearly dying i mean to be honest the older i get i'm a lot of i like lose my nerve a lot more now like I don't know if it's losing my nerve. I think it's getting more sensible and realizing I've got priorities back home. And if I die, more than just me is going to leave this earth in that sense. Like, you know what I mean? It's, like, it's going to ruin a lot of people's lives. And so for me, it's like, maybe that is why I'm a little bit more cautious. But honestly, I get a bigger buzz from like, just be, yeah, being around new people, be working, I'm on the job. We've got, a, we've got a direction, we get up, we've got this to do, let's go and do it. Uh, you know, even when you meet, like say, you know, I've interviewed, I've had some horrible interviews. You know, interviewing old women and they're like, yeah, my 14 my, my year old boy was shot dead. And like, you know, they're cuddling the toy. No, obviously I'm not getting a buzz off of that. Don't get me wrong, that is not a buzz, it's depressing, you know, and it stays with you. But 
even knowing that you can then put that out in the world and be like, hey, look what happened to this poor woman. Look what happened to her son. That's a buzz. Not a buzz of that's good. A buzz of being like, hey, fucking hell, I came here to tell this story. No one would have known mm -hmm. otherwise. To me, I just think, you know, I don't want to win awards or anything. Like, I don't give a shit about that. Um, certainly journalism awards are mostly fixed anyway. There's like, it's very funny. I could tell you it's so funny the way like journalism awards work. It's so corrupt. It's unbelievable. But I don't want to win them anyway because I, I mean, it's cringe. But like, I just want like young lads, young women to just go like, oh, I didn't know that. And now I do. That, that's all you should be doing. And that I get a buzz off that. Being like, oh, I showed someone this. And making it, the way I do my stuff, we make it, make it that you want to watch it. It's not boring. You know what I mean? We're showing, we're trying to give people a little feel of what it's like to be in that situation. Because yeah, there is a buzz. There was a real buzz. But again, it's not the life or death. It's just being in a situation that is so different to normal and being able to put this thing together to show the world. And meeting, you meet the most unreal people in the war. You know what I mean? Like, for bad or worse, even some people I've met that I hate, um, so glad I met them because it's just fascinating. I'm all about like getting a buzz from like new experiences, you know? Yeah, it's trying to understand, like you say, like, everybody, I've interviewed IRA men, UDA men, and mm. it says, if they grow a mile down the road, they'd be fighting for another cause. Yeah, yeah. It's everybody's got an agenda. Everybody's got a conditioning to what they believe is right for them at that moment. Like the surroundings, the people they're with, like grandparents losing loved ones, whatever the fuck it is, yeah. everybody's chosen chooses that path because it's the right decision they felt at the time so it's to give people for me personally even interviewing yourself or other people it's to give people the platform to tell their story for their side and mm. why they get involved in the things they've done what they've done and just that's all it is man like i think we're living in a generation now where people just love to throw their own agenda onto others and if they don't believe in them then you're a fucking bad person they try and cancel you out yeah and, yeah Fuck everybody else. It's tiring. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. E even people I don't like online, where I'm like, that person's such a cunt. You know, e I mean, to be honest, like I, I, I'm, I believe in like strong, quite militant anti-fascist causes. I believe it. if you're if you're like a, a Nazi, you want to come to my friends and say something to them. I think you should have your face smashed in. I believe that, but people were still allowed to believe bad things. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't yeah. go into someone's brain and rip out their brain for me. Well, I guess there's a difference. I mean, if you're trying to then cause violence to someone, I think then you should, you know, have violence done back to you. It's self-defense. But you can't just like tell everyone that they have to think the same thing. It Firstly, it's boring. <laughs> what a boring world. Would it? Okay, yeah, there's extremists. It's bad. And this person got upset and this happened. Yeah, that is bad. And Thank God there's people that fight them and do things. But I don't want to live in a world where everybody believes the same thing. What mm. the fuck would be the point? See, when you get in war zones, when can you ever switch off? Do you, you think you struggle with that now? PTSD or anything? I, do you know what? I didn't. But again, a lot of war reporters, yeah, they love having PTSD. <laughs> Some oh, of them, man. yeah. Because <laughs> don't get me wrong, I know a lot of reporters will hear this and be like, how dare you say that? Fuck off, it's true. I've been at bars, at like journal gatherings, it's like, can we talk about something else other than how many kids you've seen killed? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, you're trying to have a beer with your pal and he's like, you wouldn't believe what I saw in Iraq. It's like, bro, there's no cameras here. You're not on camera. No one's Sharing watching right now. stories. You know what I mean? I'm, I mate, the, for me, that is fucking atrocious. If I'm at a bar, I want to have a buzz with my pals. I don't want to hear about your mm -hmm. fucking PTSD. We've all got our issues. And also, I'm like, what you've seen, I know like single mothers on the estate where I grew up have seen 10, th 10 things worse and they're not going on about it. It's fuck off. But you do, I, I, I think that made me feel like I don't have PTSD, I'm fine. Not macho, I'm not macho at all. I'm a, I'm a clown, <laughs> you know what I mean? I like, I like being silly and whatever, but I do think that like I tried to ignore it for a long time. And after I came out of prison, then I got it quite bad. For like six months, I was very like, anytime someone knocked the door, I would just think of the keys turning in the fucking lock and my heart would go, um, yeah, and then now I know that I'll, I'll have like night terrors sometimes, you know what I mean? And then if I remember it, it's it's always I'm back in prison. So that's got to be a form of PTSD or something. Um, and then there is, there's something, I, I guess I misunderstood a lot of what PTSD was as well. Like I just thought, you know, oh, you feel bad or you feel whatever. And that is Diwali right now, right? And there's, um, you know, there's a lot of people near, near where I live were celebrating Diwali and certain fireworks just sounded like gunshots. And I didn't get scared. I just had like a bit of a rush and I was like, Ooh, that's fucking weird. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was mm. like, I didn't want that. I was like, oh, I don't like that. That's odd. Why? Like, for honestly, for a split second, it wasn't like it wasn't like I was there or anything. Like, like, uh, you know what I mean? Mm. But it was just like my body just started reacting that way. And there was one time a while ago, I was walking my dog. The weirdest thing that's happened to me actually in regarding this PTSD. I've never actually mentioned this to anyone, but I was walking my dog, 
And there was, um, a, it was actually through like a posh area. I was like, let's go and look what they're doing. So I we went through there and obviously they're all rich. So they're always building bigger bits on their house. You know, lovely, beautiful houses and whatever. But there was a, a house there that's like, it was breeze blocks. It, they hadn't put the front on it. Now in the Middle East, there's a lot of buildings that look like that. And particularly where we were filming one point in Syria and a point where when I was filming in Southeast Turkey, all of the brick buildings were like half finished. And we went past, I went past a building like that with my dog. And for some reason, for like a second or so, I was like back there. Do you know what I mean? It was really weird. It was the weirdest. I've never, only ever felt that one time. And it was like, I was not in danger. I wasn't scared. I just was suddenly, I literally, everything in my body felt like I was back in this one town where, to be honest, we'd seen some quite bad things happen there. Maybe that was the connection, but not from like anything, not from a sound, just from seeing this like breeze block building. And I kind of had to like shake it off. I was like, whoa, God, that was weird. You know what I mean? It really like rolled me up a little bit. But that's the only thing I've had like that. Maybe that's PTSD. Maybe that's, I don't know what that would be. You know what I mean? But, yeah. but I definitely think it stays with you. But I don't, I, like I'm saying, I'm not a soldier. I'm not a killer. I've never done anything like that. Those guys obviously have it like so much worse than any reporter would, I think, probably. Although I would say maybe reporters are different because you actually end up at more wars than a soldier ever would. You know what I mean? But you don't do any of the dirty work, yeah. obviously. So I think they get yeah. it worse, but I do think that you get it, but you don't, it's not always terrible that you have it. It's not always bad mm -hmm. to remember certain things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I, I don't struggle with it is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Yeah, because a soldier's going to war. He knows what he's going to war for. Oh, absolutely. But for a journalist yeah. who's maybe seen a fucking kid's head blow off or mm. seen fucking dead bodies everywhere, yeah. like, you're not expecting it so obviously it's like a doctor maybe get used to it maybe becomes cold to it doesn't yeah. mean it doesn't fucking affect him yeah. do you know what I mean so was there not a, tw a, like a 14 year old girl as well you've seen wrapped in bandages yeah man yeah man I wrote about it yeah that really always stays with me but it doesn't stay with me in a way of like it's not waking me up at night it's just I think about it a lot there was a young girl that had been shot in southeast Turkey and, and She'd been, she had like a bullet wound in the back and then she had shrapnel in the head or the other way around, I forget. But she was all like wrapped up in bandage. And yeah, they said she was 14 or 13, I forget, but around that age, yeah. And it was like, she, the cousin come over. I think her parents were dead or I don't know what happened, but the cousin was looking after her and they were like, it was in the middle of like, like the combat zone. But this was in a, in a town, so it wasn't like, there was no like real front lines. The whole town was the front line, essentially. You know, you just hear firing at any moment after leave or get down or whatever but yeah so she comes over and the cousin kind of unwraps the bandages and i was like no no no, she said, no, no you have to see this and it's like kind of like it wasn't terrible there was like you i mean you could see the holes there was pus coming out of one of them and they were explaining what happened and she was she was explaining i'd have to ask Rizal for the full like interpretation because obviously it was kurdish and he was speaking but from what i remember she was basically saying like we can't really go to the hospital because they'll arrest us the turkish soldiers um because they'll just say that we're terrorists and it's like, we're not terrorists. This girl just got caught in the line of fire, you know? And that night, I remember seeing a thing where they had actually parked these armored vehicles outside the, the A&E. So like where the ambulance is meant to go, they parked basically a, a, an APC, like like a tank, let's say a tank, like a tank kind of vehicle outside the A&E. And I just, that really, I just was like, man, that's some kind of evil, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's mm. some kind of like, I don't know. It's just like, it's just really brutal. And then, yeah, and that girl, yeah, I just remember thinking like, man, I hope she's all right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, mean I mean, I think things are deeply saddening, um, but it sticks with you. It's good that that stays with you. If that just left you and you just forgot, oh, I forgot about that. I think, man, you're in the wrong job because you need empathy to be a reporter. You can't be, there's a lot of journalists that are like, I, I had it as well. Like, you know, people that I'd spend time with, I know so many young people, or old or whatever, people that I'd spent time with in the war zones that are dead now and they died violent deaths, like so many. And you know, that would all, every single one I'd find out like he's dead, I'd be like, oh, fucking hell. Like I'm gutted, I can't believe that lad died. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was at Vice one time and he's actually, he's actually me and him are kind of get on quite well, but he was like, why do you care? Like you didn't even know him. I was like, mate, we were like in a life and death situation together for like 48 hours. He invited me into his land or whatever, you know, we shared dinner, we shared a drink and, you know, he kind of kept us safe and we came to tell his story. For me, that's a very fascinating bond. Okay, you're not best friends. You're not going to like, you know, you're not, you're not going to be like that, but that's important, I think, you know, it's an experience. It's a human connection. So everyone that dies, I'm real sad about it. I'm like, oh, fuck, man, I'm gutted he died, yeah. you know? And, and you know, I found it re really weird that reports like, I get used to it as part of the job. And I'm like, I don't want to ever get used to that. Okay, you do a little bit, but I don't want to get fully used to that because 
it's good to care that yeah. people you've shared an experience with die. That's mm -hmm. completely normal and human, you know? So see when the war in Russia and Ukraine started, mm. how did you end up over in Ukraine working with the, well, doing the reporting on the Ukraine ultras, was oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah, the ultras, man, yeah. So so I, I've been, to, before the war, before this war, I've been mm. going to Ukraine since 2016. Because the war has actually been gone up, been ongoing since 2014, but you know, very just in the east. So, see when you report, were you reporting that way back then? Yeah, yeah. So, see when it goes yeah. mainstream just a year ago. Yeah. Do you yeah. then think, fuck me, like I was reporting on yeah, that? A little bit. Do you kind of get annoyed. <laughs> a little that bit. You've already reported on yeah. something like even being in Turkey and then with the Kurdish and this and that. If that kicks off in four years and then people start reporting it, then yeah, you will be thinking, well, I've. I like, oh, for fuck's sake. Well, I don't really, I feel a little bit, but also I'm like, thank God everyone's paying attention to it. Cause it's like, it's not my yeah. beat, but there is some, I tell you what pisses me off that when all the reports flood there, I'm like, good, that, that I think that's good. What does piss me off? Um, well, what the Telegraph has just done. So the Telegraph newspaper in England has just written an article about this documentary that you're talking about with the ultras, mm -hmm. the same group interviewed one of them and not mentioned my reporting at all. They've not said, by the way, Jake Hanrahan did, the, I was the first one to do that yeah. doc. And they were a very underground group. You would have not heard of them. There is no way this guy heard of them without seeing my work first. So that kind of thing pisses me off. All you have to say is, by the way, like, oh, first reported by, yeah, of course. I'd be like, no problem. It's lazy, John. No, it's very it? lazy. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually more than that. It, it's not like, lazy would be forgetting. Mm -hmm. Omitting it on purpose is like cruel. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's fucking sly. Stealing somebody's work. Basically. He's stealing someone's work, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so I, I was I was reporting in, in uh, East Ukraine. Um, I think I've, I've been to Ukraine like about 10 times. Like So you've already got a bond with? Yeah, yeah, Ukraine, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and so I've been on both sides yeah, as well, yeah. by the way. I've been on the, the Russian back side as well. Um, I got kicked out, I got banned from there because they didn't like what I produced. Um, it's, a, it's like North Korea there, it's fucking crazy. I'm so glad I got to go there. It's one of the most fascinating places I've ever been to. Um, everything is fake <laughs> like it's really really weird man it's so creepy and you're not allowed to go anywhere without a minder so it, there has to be one of their people with you the whole time like to even leave the hotel to like go and get like a drink from the from the shop like a juice they're like they wait for you and they take you and they take you back it's fucking mental <laughs> really weird place man um but yeah yeah so i'm reporting on that so the last documentary um i just done which is probably the one i'm most proud of probably ever i think so in in east ukraine Sorry, in Ukraine, there's a very, very big, violent subculture of football hooliganism. Now, it's not, I'm going to offend a lot of English football hooligans here, but I think Eastern European hooliganism is real football hooliganism. Getting smashed with a big fat belly and doing 15 lines and like glassing some 18 year old which we've seen with like a lot of old school football hooliganism in England is not really, I'm not that interested in it. Eastern European is like, they all go MMA. They're all like, most of them are like straight edge. They don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't do drugs. You know, they're like fucking machines and they're good at combat. They do Muay Thai. They, that to me, I'm fascinated by that. Not to say that, I shouldn't say it's not real hooliganism, but I think now that the old British style has died, that is what is real now. You know what I'm saying? And there's a lot more effort put into it. Um, and I, to be honest, I, I have no issue with hooligan football hooliganism personally. I don't feel like you should tell a group of lads that mutually agree to fight each other that they're not allowed to fight each other. Like, why? They're not fighting random, like random people in the street. They're meeting in a contained area to fight. I th why is the gov? What's that got to do with the government? I don't understand that. But anyway, so so in Ukraine, they've got a very hardcore football hooliganism scene, like unbelievable. You're talking like 70 on 70 fights. They meet up in the fields. I'm sure you've seen stuff about this. But unfortunately, a majority of that subculture is far right, neo-Nazi, like very, you know, it's like the same with any country. I mean, Italy is literally just voted in like, openly pro-fascist government we have it everywhere in in uh, in, in europe um but yeah same same in russia as well all their hooligans 99 percent neo-nazi eastern europe that's what happens all racist um, brutally racist <laughs> yeah like unbelievably like swastikas everything um but within that scene there was one hooligan firm that were the opposite so they said, nah, we're like, we don't like that shit. We're anti-fascist. We're, we're against you. We don't like Nazism. We're not against gay people. We're not against black people. You know what I mean? We don't like that. And they weren't even that explicitly political. They were, I mean, like, that is a political stance. Don't get me wrong. But they were like, you know, they weren't like, oh, we're the communists. We're the anarchists. They were just like, we don't like that shit. We're against that. So they formed their own group. 
Um, and they're as tough as the far right ones, which again is like the Americans were, when they watched our doc, they were like, what, these guys are anti-fa? I'm like, yeah. And they were like, but they're really tough. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like this isn't, this isn't blue hair screaming somewhere like which a lot of Americans associate with whatever, which yeah, I don't care. It's whatever. But, um, so these are like very hardcore lads that just decided to do the other side. They were like, no, we're not racist. So we're going to fight you. And so in the end, basically, Hutzut clan, their name is, which the name is kind of when they'd see the Nazis, they'd say, Hutz, 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 put your hood up. And then they, you know, <laughs> they're fighting them. And clan was just a kind of, they were kind of mocking them, you know, like the Ku Klux, Klux clan. clan. They were like, all right, we're the Hutz, Hutz clan, but we're anti racist. So, like, you know, they're fucking with them. That's what Ukrainian comedy, that's the Ukrainians are such funny, lovely. I love their culture. They're like tough people, but they don't mind being silly, you know, and I love that kind of style. Um, unfortunately, when we did our doc, a load of like leftist Americans like, why are they called Hoods Hoods Clan? Are they secretly the Ku Klux Klan? I was like, no, <laughs> they're not. Like, sorry, America, the world doesn't revolve around you, you know. But anyway, so these lads all came together, and they were the only ones. So literally, every other football hooligan, football ultra firm in Ukraine were like, they're our enemy. So they fought everyone. So like, they were in this very specific situation where you, all the Nazi groups teamed up to beat them up. Luckily for them, Hutzus clan were like extremely good at fighting and putting them in a corner gave them like a brotherhood. And they were also punks. So they're like very, they're all straight edge as well, most of them. So they're like, you know, covered in tattoos, no drink, no drugs, no smoking, you know, like a lot of them are vegan, which another thing that very surprised a lot of Americans, like big, huge, like hardcore fighters that are vegan. Um, so they were like, they had a real brotherhood, you know, they put on these punk shows and whatever. So that made them real strong. So when the Nazis came for them, you, there's actually, it's really funny. There's a book called um, 1312 Amongst the Ultras. And this guy, um, Filimonov, he's like a, a fascist fighter. He was uh, one of the main guys of the Dynamo Kiev uh, Ultras firm, which they were called the White Boys. And they're like openly, you know, swastikas on their t-shirts and everything. He even admits, he's like, yeah, Hutzel's clown. He's like, I don't like them. They beat the shit out of me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they were fucking people up. And so these fascists were getting really upset that they were getting beaten up by like gay people or someone that's not anti-gay or what, you know what I mean? Whatever, like, so that happened. So they just became this, like this very strong group of friends. Um, how many was in them? Oh man, hundreds at one point. Yeah, there's, so uh, this is really funny. So this, this is how petty the far right groups were. So in my research, I found like a, a football hooligan ultras like forum that's where they kind of gather and they basically said no one is allowed to even speak and this wasn't ukraine and this was all of europe most of the ultras are far right in europe you know so they said no one's even allowed to speak about hoods hoods clan because they were so embarrassed that their guys were getting beaten up by anti-fascists so what they did was they went on a campaign to remove all of like hoods hoods clans videos off of youtube and when I spoke to Anton, like the main guy, I was like, have you got footage? Because I couldn't find it. And he was like, yeah, we got footage. There was over 80 videos of them fighting. They, when I watched the video, I was like, all right, these guys are real hardcore. You know what I mean? So they were all like on it. And yeah, they had hundreds of members. This is again, which is very funny for the Russian propaganda. Everyone in Ukraine's a Nazi. It's like, no, there's a subculture of Nazism, unfortunately. Like it's there. Here's a hundred anti-fascists fighting it. You know what I mean? So when the war started, of course, you know, they're anti-fascist, but they love their country. You know, they, they love freedom. And again, they've even said like, one of them really made a great point to me. He was like, look, we don't like the fascists. We don't like them. But if Putin takes over, there will be no anti-fascist, fascist, punk, this, that, and the other. There will just be Putin. And that's it. He's like, we at least want the chance to have our own ideology. And I think he's right. You know what I mean? I mean, anarchists in Russia get, um, you know, gulagged completely. It's, it's, a, it's a similar thing. And a lot of the Nazis are backed by the Kremlin government. There's a great documentary called Credit for Murder about how the Kremlin basically funded a load of Nazi groups to commit some murders to then come down hard on them and whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like the idea was they were like, we like these different ideologies. So when the war started, they were like, all right, fuck it. So they hit up the, the, the fascist groups. They said, look, there's a bigger problem right now. We don't like you, you don't like us, but our country is being invaded. We will all be killed if, you know, if we, if we don't kind of have a truce. So, you know, the, all the fascist groups and the anti-fascist groups said, all right, we've got a truce, no problem. Like, no more fighting each other, no more brother wars. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, no more fighting each other. For now, we put it all on ice and we fight Russia. So Hutsus clan said, okay. So the Hutsus clan, they got their weapons and they went to the front line, but they didn't really want to like, they're like, we don't like them guys. 
we've got a truce with them. But we don't want to fight with them. Unfortunately, some had to because they were put in different units, but they formed their own group. So there's like a load of, there's a whole, there's dozens and dozens of like left wing mm -hmm. fighters right now in Ukraine. And they were a part of that. Um, now they're on the front line. Unfortunately, their command, the commander, um, Yuri, um, he died like a month ago. Really sad. Yeah, he was, he was the guy that brought them all together. Killed? Killed, yeah, by Russian Shit. forces. Yeah, yeah, we met him, man. We were filming with him. Oh, Lovely guy, lovely, like. Because even when the war started, like the fact that you say Ken Klitschko and mm. they seen them just grabbing a rifle and going straight to the front line, like I've not seen him on the front. I'll be honest. But is that, was that <laughs> do you think that's just show then, or I think they, it was. Well, were yeah. they generally going to? I, well, I think if if they had been no, don't don't be wrong. I think if like Usyk and Klitschko, I think if they'd have said right, you can go to the front. They'd be like, well, let's go. Mm -hmm. I think the government went More hey, protected. I think the government just went hey, we need people like you to represent us across the world. Yeah. They're not wrong by that. If Klitschko, I mean, if Usyk suddenly got killed, there's no one on the boxing stage. Well, there's Lomachenko, but you know what I mean. There's not like that big of a profile mm -hmm. to say hey, remember Ukraine is 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 at war, which actually is a smart move. So I don't, I don't, I, I'm certain Usyk and Klitschko themselves yeah. would definitely go there. You know What's what the mean? population of Ukraine? Oh, it's over like 66 million. So it's still a big fucking oh, it's country, huge, man. man. Yeah, this is what's very funny, right? So this one, the country Russia, 150, 160? Something like that, yeah, yeah massive. But it, it's very funny, Six, yeah, 60 million, I think is the rough thing. But when, it's really funny, when the like, the people say, oh, well, you know, Ukraine is a Nazi junta. Everyone there's a Nazi. It's like, no, no, there's a serious problem, a subculture of Nazism. But 73% of 60 million people voted in Zelensky. Zelensky is Jewish. It's the worst Nazi junta that ever existed, if that was true. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, what, what do you mean? Like, yeah, but there's some Nazis in the front. I'm like, yeah, I mean, go to any war ever. I've met Nazis in the Middle East. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's a there's a Syrian militia that's neo-Nazi in the Middle East. You know what I mean? It's it's like it's unfortunate. They're a fucking cancer, but they're everywhere. But essentially, if your village is getting hit, right? Imagine someone bombed us right now and some guys running with guns like we'll help. Yeah. I wouldn't be like, hey, wait there. What's your ideology? <laughs> if they were like, oh, I'm a Nazi, out you go. I'd be like, fuck it, you're a cunt, but whatever, <laughs> save yeah. me. You know what I mean? Old Babushka, she, mm -hmm. she's sitting there and her house gets hit with a bomb. She's not asking the lads that come and help her what their ideology is, you know? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there's, but there's, that's the thing. They only focus on, like, I'm like, do you know how many different weird ideologies there are in Ukraine? There's, right now, there are neo Nazis fighting alongside Chechen like militants who are on the same side, <laughs> you know what I mean? There are like Muslims and anarchists fighting in the same battalion. War is an absolute mess, you know what I mean? That's what it is. And I don't get, I'm actually surprised that people are surprised. Mm -hmm. They're like, huh, Nazis and anti-fascists fighting on the same side. I'm like, do you know what a country is? Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, imagine if war came here, we'd have all different people fighting. Mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't be arguing, oh, don't, don't hang out with them. Because if you're protecting your country, you're protecting your country at the end of the day. And like Anton said from World Tuts Clan, he said, look, we don't like them. We've made a truce to them. When this war is over, then we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, there's a lot of like, even the fascist groups have kind of gone, this is actually what, what we thought would be good. This is what it looks like. You know, Russia coming in and fucking chaining people up and executing them in the street. And a lot of them are kind of gone like, maybe not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, it's quite interesting. There's a very big ideological shift happening. And hopefully off, after the end of this war, hopefully some of them will learn some of them will become more extreme and worse. You know what I mean? Um, but it's the same on the other side. There's a whole battalion of neo-Nazis on the Russian side called Rushik. Wagner Group, literally Wagner, like the main guy, has a fucking swastika tattoo, the guy that run it. So it's very weird when you see them like running, we're on a Nazification mission. It's like, really? Where's the most racist place you've been? <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, God knows. I don't know. I mean, it depends. I mean, it's... That, I mean, it's a good question because it, I, I really hate this thing where people don't want to like, they, they want to shy away from it. And don't get me wrong, I'm not one of these people that's obsessed with all that. That makes life so fucking boring. You know what I mean? But it must be hard when you're living yeah. it. Yeah, you're seeing it. Exactly. You're seeing you hear something and you're like, the tattoos. You're the seeing the yeah, yeah, madness. Exactly. You're seeing the hatred against gays Absolutely. And and for me, and, I'm against that. Yeah. And it's, but, it, but then what am I going to do? It's like, I can't then be like, I'm out of here. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's very difficult. Ah, man, I, I'll be because honest. Even though people think the UK is bad, but keep listening to these stories, it oh, seems mate. fucking more extreme. Oh, it's way more extreme. Yeah. Eastern Europe is, yeah. You, but but again, Eastern Europe is, you can't really weigh it next to England. It's yeah. it's, it's its own animal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm. like Serbia is like its own place. Albania, like all these crazy, you know, and you've got like, you know, Eastern European Muslim countries living next to like ultra-nationalist right-wing countries. Like, it's fucking crazy. It's very... 
interesting. Like I, to be honest, I think like, okay, this is bad. That is bad. But I'm not like, I don't want everyone. I remember my mom used to say to me like, oh, the way you think, what you want everyone to think like that? Or you want, what if everyone did what you did? You know, when I've been in trouble, I do something stupid. It's like, what if everyone did that? And I'm like, everyone's not going to do what I want. And that's why life's interesting. That's why life mm -hmm. is worth living to find out all these different views and different things, you know? So as well as, and it's okay for me to be like, I'm against that. Like, I don't get why these days, a lot of people are like, oh, you big lefty. Oh, you don't want to stand for that. Like, no, I don't. Sorry, I don't want to stand. I don't want to say it's okay to be a fucking racist. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I think that's bad. If you think that's good, fine. But I hate you. We're enemies. I don't get, I don't think there's anything wrong being a grown man and drawing your line in the sand and saying, I stand for this. I don't like that. But then that doesn't mean that I'm on the internet. Like, cancel this guy. Get him off Twitter. Like, no, because then it's like, Again, how boring, you know? Yeah. Like some of the most fascinating conversations I've ever had are with people that- You're against? I'm against, yeah. yeah but it's like, I'm still going to talk to them. Like, Same yeah, as I myself. Like, I want to have you interested in people and people go, oh, it doesn't mean I, I don't on? agree with why them. Why have you had yeah, him on? It's not as if I agree why with have, them. Why have I had a conversation yeah. with someone that's interesting? Yeah. Are you really asking me that? But how was that for crazy? you when, if you're against racism, to be somebody that's fucking for it? Yeah. Pure, like, how fascinating every, that still, It's still fascinating for the discussion. Of course like, it I've, is. I've sat of with everybody from both ends. I've sat with... Uh, same, same. And, and I, I love the discussion. That it's to understand their mindset and it's yeah. not a past judgment. No, no. That's no. why it's not a challenge and shout and scream and oh, believe what I believe because yeah. then I wouldn't get the caliber I guess that I can get. It's just a business at the end of the day. Mate, right? that, that's why it's... But the thing is though, as grown adults telling other grown adults off for who they speak to on their podcast, what kind of time are we living in like well i say it to some people i'm like i'm a, I'm a grown man like are you telling me off mm -hmm. are you an adult telling off another adult like that has somehow become a normal thing to do where i'm from you don't tell off other people like that you yeah. know what i mean i mean sure you do but like okay my grandma can tell me off my mum can tell me off you on the internet can't tell me yeah. off. You know what Skating I mean? the battle with this yeah. one. It's the same shite comments. Like, it's... if I'll post a photo with a, a drug lord uh, promoting crime again, oh, and I'm thinking, fuck fucking sake, shut man. up. Honestly, I think man. that comment tells me more about you and it does try to portray Absolutely. the character of the person that's on yeah. my show. Like, Look, just don't uh, watch. Don't watch it. Exactly. Yeah, don't that. like it. Fuck off. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's like, you know, there's a lot of things that people say to me, why are, we have the problem with on um, so my platform, Popular Front, we've got like a massive, well, mate, we've got like over 400,000 people on our Instagram, right? Um, following it. And the 90% of the comments, just the worst people you've ever come across in your life. Like I, we joke, we're like, we have the worst, we reckon we have the worst Instagram comment section <laughs> on earth. I reckon. <laughs> and people are like, email, email, like, why do you allow this? I'm like, mm -hmm. what do you mean? This is the internet. Don't read it. Why have you allowed it? Because that's, what do you want me to do? You're going to pay for me to curate it and delete every comment you don't like? No, fuck off then. Mm -hmm. Like grow some fucking balls, man. Like the life is harsh. You're going to come across people that are horrible. Tough luck. I'm not your mum. I say that. I'm not your nanny. Mm -hmm. I don't like that this is there. I don't like that you're bothering me about it. I don't care. Why are you wasting time? Again, I say to people, I say, if you really just spent an hour reading Instagram comments here, you could have watched the film. You could have read a book. Like, like, there's a real problem where people are wasting time on social media. Don't get me wrong. I use it. It's a great tool for this, that, and the other. Oh, you know, sometimes it's a bit crafty. We'll, we'll like argue in the comments with other people very rarely, but now and then we do it if we need an algorithm boost because then about a hundred people start commenting yeah. all of a sudden then the post goes up it's great for us who gives mm -hmm. a fuck these people are vermin like you know use them for what you can like not i don't mean i'm not mean like all our followers i mean the people are saying the awful things on 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 um on instagram and it's just i just think to people like get a hobby like you'll feel better you it's know the people mean? with the cartoon characters as a profile picture it's the people who's oh, fucking god man it's, it's always the anonymous yeah. it's always the anonymous but it's yeah, just yeah. business as well like you've just got to let them fight and argue i do man where's the worst what zone you've been in? In terms of, I mean, it depends how you would define worse. I would probably say like- With deaths. Deaths and that, yeah. I mean, I would say, honestly, like, well, worse death, took death Syria because like, obviously ISIS were doing the craziest shit there. But when I was there, it was pretty calm. You know what I mean? We didn't see like, we weren't there for, well, we were in Rojava, the Northeast Syria, the Kurdish areas where they control it. And it was, it was pretty calm there. And then we went to, Al Hol, which is the camp where they've got all the like ISIS brides, you know, where Shamima was and all that. That was just fucking unreal. That was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. They're so confident because they're all in the cab 
um, because, you know, the Kurds are like, all right, you know, we respect that. That's fine. But the, at the time when we were there, they were doing loads of stabbings. <laughs> so they would like, they would like brush past you and put, we had to go everywhere with arm guard and they would brush past you and like knock into you and you're like, fuck. And they just know they're like, we can fuck with you. You know what I mean? They're like, you can't stop us. Not all of them, like a lot of them actually kind of went into like a de-radicalization program. We're just like, we've had enough. You know what I mean? We don't want this. We choose the wrong path. And the Kurds said, okay, we'll help you get out. And a lot of them then get moved to Roj camp. That's what happened to Shamima. Um, whether Shamima is really about that or not, I don't know. I think she's a very selfish person. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just think she'll do what is ever good for her. But a lot of them, we met them and they're like, you know, you can't just be like, oh, fuck them. They chose their path. People choose a lot of wrong paths in life. Don't get me wrong. Like, I, I think... You know, their time will come, I'm sure. But some of them were like, yeah, we, we, you know, once we got captured, we realized like the Kurds or whoever it was we were against were like kind of all right. Like, you know what I mean? They weren't what we were told or whatever. But the worst were the foreigners because they're the foreign volunteers, right? The ones that come from England and the West and wherever. They knew what it was like. They lived in a different society. Don't get me wrong. I think there's serious problems with the way we live in the West. I mean, just look at the way that young men are killing themselves in this country. There's a reason. But they knew what they were going to. They got Google, they got the internet, they got free speech, they got they can look at anything they want. And then they still chose to go and join ISIS. Them are like, they're the most evil ones. And them ones were still like the most <laughs> they were the worst ones in the camp. They're like barging you. The the woman that was that was um running the camp, like a couple of weeks before, she just got back to work. They they used they got the kids to help them. Um, they burst in the office and like beat her up and covered her in petrol. And luckily a guy came in just before they lit her up. So they were they were like starting their own little war there. So in a way, Al Hol was one of the worst places because you're talking like you just got like <laughs> ISIS brides there everywhere, and they're all you don't know what they're up to, and they've got weapons everywhere and that. And that that was one of the least safe places I've felt. There's okay, a mortar round is terrifying. A mortar comes over, and you just like Ugh! you just kind of like wait until it lands and hope it doesn't land on you. But like seeing like a crowd of, you know, women in the cab, all in black, and you can't see any of them. You don't know if they've got weapon, you don't know if they've got knife or anything. They're like coming right at you. I was like, I was looking at the guy with the gun, I was like, bro, bro, bro. I was like, help, help. Like, you know what I mean? I mean, not quite that bad, but it was, you, you, do, you do feel like, fuck, man, they might just stab me in my chest. I think the week we left, the guy got like stabbed in his heart, doing the same thing, uh, like walking around. Because I had a CIA agent on, but he's saying a lot of people in ISIS are forced to be in ISIS, mm -hmm. whether they threaten their wife or to take no, their that, kids. Yeah, it's yeah. not as if they vol vol if you volunteer and to, you fuck to you. do yeah, bad yeah, stuff yeah. and fuck them, but a lot of people are forced and he doesn't, people need to understand that yeah. a lot of these fuckers are forced well, to Well, I, I interviewed two ISIS guys um, in Iraq and one was like the media guy for Nineveh province, which is an area in northern Iraq. And he was like there, you know, like he, he was running all the media. He was putting out like, look what we've done. He was filming beheadings, all that shit. Mm -hmm. He, um, he'd been captured. So I interviewed him after he was arrested and he was like very hardcore. He's like, yeah, I'm ISIS. I do. Well, they don't call it that. He's like, I joined and he was doing like, you know, like one Umar, we will get you, like we'll take her over. Then we interviewed another guy from the same region. He was a farmer. His brother-in-law basically joined ISIS because he wanted to, same as this other guy. But he comes to the guy and, and genuinely you could tell this guy was very, how do I say it? I don't want to be offensive, but like, he was very low, like, intelligence. Like, you just tell, not because not he's a farm, but you just tell this guy just nothing was going yeah, in. Fucking a dick, basically. Yeah, basically, you know what I mean? Like, a fucking dumb guy. Yeah, yeah. Nice guy, I'm sure, but dumb as fuck. And he's there, and, like, he's like, look, man, he's like, he, he, I felt like he was being honest. Obviously, I had an interpreter, but you, it's weird. You remember conversations if they were talking almost when you have a good interpreter. He's like, look, I was on this farm. My brother-in-law turns up, and he's like, look, we're starting this new thing. We've just taken Mosul. You are you're, you have to join. And he said first, he's like, nah, man, fuck that. I'm not joining that. Like, he was, he, he even said, so he was like, he, even like most Muslims in the East, he was like, I was just chill like he's like i don't know he's like i smoke i i don't care like you know what i mean he drank he wasn't like very strict or whatever he's like i was just whatever doing my thing and the brother-in-law was like no you're a bad muslim he's like oh for fuck's sake goes away manages to like kind of push him away then the next thing so he comes again he's like you have to join now like you have to he's like i don't want to he kills all his sheep he's like now what do you got he's like what the fuck man <laughs> you've killed all my sheep he's like how are you gonna make money he's like what uh long story short he just basically like was like look if you don't join we'll just have to kill you because you're, you're you're against us and we're coming here so then he's like fuck it i'll join and even the guys like the kurdish jailers that like arrested him even said they were like he's telling the truth like we looked into it 
You know what I mean? They were like, he he didn't really have a choice. I'm sure he killed or I, well, I don't even know if he did. He probably just like, like you know what I mean, firing over the line. But I felt really bad for him. I was like, man, like what a bad start. You know what I mean? Like he was just he had like no teeth. You know what I mean? He's just like a normal kind of farm guy out there, and he just got pushed into it. So there's a big difference. You know what I mean? Is there any war zones you would like to go to? Yeah, man. I mean, there's. To be honest, I, the older I get, I'm more interested in like more like underground kind of stories than just the war. Like the front line is actually. Do you think you've done it, completed that, done that? Yeah. Not, nah, nah, but I, it's definitely, I've come to realise that like it's not always the most interesting place. It, I think you do need to go to get an understanding because there's things you learn, the dynamic you learn. So like say you're with a unit and they're all this, that and the other, but when you see them on the front, they're like differently and you go like, ah, he's actually in charge. He might be the lieutenant, but this guy is clearly the guy that's in charge mm -hmm. and you just learn things about human interactions when they're in combat. So I think that's important. But I don't feel the need to be out on a front line for like three weeks. I'm like, I go there, see the fighting, get that footage because I think it's important to show there's actual fighting going on. Here's what's happening. And then I'm like, let me go and get the rest of the stuff. Like, cause I feel like away from the front or just in the midst of the war zone, you find a lot more interesting stories now. You know, there's only so much you can get with this guy shoots gun. Now he's dead. It's sad. You know what I mean? Or whatever, which is sad. But it's like there's only so many people you can keep engaged with that. And the reason we do this, if you want to be a journalist, you want people to watch your stuff, right? As many as possible. So I want to do engaging stories. Like, you know, with my platform, Popular Front, we'll never be first. We don't have the money to be first, but we're always, we're always different. You know what I mean? So everyone was doing, okay, we're on the front line. Here's some soldiers, da, da, da. Okay, that's good. It's good to see. It. It's important. Quentin Somerville from BBC was doing some of the best Ukraine coverage I've seen. Um, so there's definitely a place for it. But we were like, it's like, okay, who else is going to hang out with the anti-fascist football hooligan firm that is now a unit fighting Russia? Us, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, we're going to do it. And the way we made it, we made it in a way that was, you know, there was no judgment. A lot of people were like, I can't believe you made a doc about football hooliganism and didn't condemn the violence. Mm. Fuck off. Mm. Shut up. About what? <laughs> what's the, yeah. what's the condemn? Who cares? Uh, it's not my business. I don't you know have you a murder on say, oh, that's fucking oh, terrible. Bad, that, yeah. I'm pretty sure they that's know. It, <laughs> fuck off. You know what? Cancel the interview. The job is just to get the story, exactly. what they do, exactly. what they do for that. People is... need to stop wanting their journalists to be like moral arbiters, you know? Yeah. Don't but get me still wrong. watch it. The exactly. biggest fucking hitters on Netflix oh, is true oh. crime. Yeah, Jeffrey yeah. Dahmer. Absolutely. People yeah. are in their house fucking watching mad shit, but then they, they want to be holier than thou though yeah. while they're watching it, right? Yeah. They want to watch it up there when they yeah, see it. Yeah, I've had <laughs> porn stars on and people are absolutely slating them. Ah. As if nobody's ever watched fucking porn, do you know what I mean? It's exactly. Like, do you know exactly. what I mean? Also, like, yeah, that to me, I really believe in leave people alone. Like yeah. if they if they're not bothering anyone else like just just it's none of your business you know yeah. I mean? someone's like oh i want to be a prostitute if as so long as no one's abusing her into it or she's doing i'm like okay mm -hmm. like they're slipping the moral standards of what fucking moral standards yeah. of society the richest bloke in britain has just been fucking not even elected been brought in to like decide the lives of the poorest there is no moral standards in this country if there was you'd be out there on the fucking streets but no one's doing nothing yeah. everybody's just diluted with gadgets and fucking get the bag culture like did you, know you ever I mean? go to palestine yeah yeah what was that like loved it loved it do really you get the media t-shirt tops or anything now nah, like, well i wear press you do have to wear like press. i mean i wear a press patch mm -hmm. if you obviously if you've got the the bulletproof vest on which we wear a lot i make sure i got the blue one because that, that represents you as press and I wear a press patch because there's a lot of people right now in Ukraine doing really dumb shit where they're basically dressing up like combatants. I know a girl that was wearing camouflage on the front line and was photoing herself with a gun and she's a filmmaker. I was like, if Russia kills you, they can then use that to kill all of us. That's an excuse because they can go, well, look what the reporters are dressing up like militants. Fuck it, we'll just start killing reporters. And to be honest, they'd have a leg to stand on by saying that when people do dumb shit like that. So when they, when reporters do that, it pisses me the fuck off. I'm like, you're a reporter, you shouldn't be handling weapons, you shouldn't be shooting weapons, and you shouldn't be dressing up like fucking action, man. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we wear the press patch. Um, Palestine was great, man. Jerusalem, East Jerusalem had a good time there. Well, it's a very hard story. Like, it was brutal. You know, we were covering the clashes outside Al-Aqsa. Um, and I did a story in Israel with Hasidic ravers, which was very fun. Like these guys are like, you know, uh, like hardcore Hasids with the hair and all that. But there were one group called the Rabbi Nachman and like all the other Hasids fucking hate them. Whenever there's like one group where everyone else hates them, I'm like, I reckon they're cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? I love like, 
I'm not, I don't like the cool crowd. I like misfits and fucking punks and like shy kids and goths and you. I love all that shit. I think people like are great. So there's one guy, the Rabbi Nachman, and basically the way they celebrate their beliefs, they dance. So they drive around in this van, they jump out and they fucking dance. We turn up at like one of the um, the synagogues and they're like pounding music and all these like hyper conservative like um, Hasids are like fucking bastards. <laughs> like it's so funny. But Palestine was good as well, man. Yeah, I covered the, it's a very fucking sad situation there. Like yeah. it's just, that doesn't get enough coverage it doesn't me. get do you know what it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't but i would say like i mean if a rock gets thrown in in like palestine very quickly people start descending on it a fucking whole invasion happens in armenia which happened two months ago no one gives a shit you know what i mean there is there is like there is a media presence but it doesn't get enough at the same time yeah mm -hmm. and it's very I got accused, it's funny actually, I got accused this morning, ironically, um, of being a far, a far right white supremacist <laughs> because we posted up what was considered to be a pro-Palestine post. And essentially we were saying like a Palestinian resistance group. And they said, call them a terrorist group. So we don't, we never use that word. We don't use that word just because it's a very loaded term. Even ISIS, we'll say ISIS militants, which is a perfect descriptor of what they are. They're a militant. Militant doesn't mean good or bad. It's just the descriptor, like, you know, whatever. So we're saying, no, I was like, no, we don't use that word. Oh, you're a fucking white supremacist. You hate Jews. I was like, what? No, I don't. <laughs> like, what the yeah. fuck? I was like, bro. And I said, I just bought that. I said, bro, I spent like two weeks with Rabbi Nachman. Like, I had a great time. Like, here's some photos of me hanging out with him. Like, he's like, oh, so you know some Jews. I was like, what the fuck is going on, man? I was like, and then I realized, I was like, hang on, this is like a bad faith thing. This isn't actually about the situation. It doesn't help anyone there. And the, you know, and the, the guy that he, he clearly, he was from America, he didn't even live there. And I was like, you know what, fuck that. And it's like, when you just step away, I said, you know what, man, have a good day. Whatever you think of me is fine. It's not true, it's all good, whatever, carry on. Sorry you think this, but whatever. And then like, when I look back at like what we were actually posting, I was like, yeah, we said the right thing. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I'm not having someone else dictate the language mm -hmm. for me. And that is unfortunately where a lot of the controversy comes from. One person, I'm not saying like Palestinians or Israelis, just anyone saying like, you have to say it like this. It's like, bro, do you know how complicated this conflict is? It's not that, it's not that simple. You yeah. know what I mean? What's the best bit of work you think you've done? I think the, the so I think the doc we just did, Frontline Hooligan, is one of my favorite bits because it really... How did you get an in? Basically, man, it's really funny. So I saw the guy that was kind of like, he's kind of the de facto leader of Hoods Hoods clan. He's like the, he speaks good English, Anton, really nice guy. And he, he runs like a cool kind of clothing brand in Kiev, you know what I mean? And I saw him on Instagram and I went to message him and to be like, oh, wow, I see what you guys are doing. I didn't know who you were, like very interesting. I would love to come and film you guys. And as I went to message him, he'd already messaged me, but he's in the request, you know, I've got like a billion requests or whatever, we don't look at it. And he was basically like, like, a year before the war he was like hey man really love what you guys are doing like just basically saying like i like it appreciate what you're doing like it's very cool so i was like ah oh, fucking hell i was like hey, oh thanks i didn't see it. He's like, yeah man he's like you guys want to film with us i was like yeah he's like fuck it let's do it so i was like all right cool we'll see how it goes we'll see how it goes and he just made everything easy he was like you want to come come I was like, all right we go to kiev and this one of the times we didn't need a fix so we just got to kiev and he's like where are you he said we're here come and got us <laughs> like in his military van he's like off you come get in here like we didn't even really have to have accreditation and you know god rest his soul yuri the commander i realized he made it happen you know what mm -hmm. i mean he kind of was like i'll turn a blind eye just bring this fucking yeah. reporter in you know no restrictions nothing and in the end we kind of hutu's clan of my kind of people you know what I, mean? I get on with them they're, they're not like, certainly i mean it's it's gonna get down to i don't want to go into this like woke shit but they're like anti-fascist they're leftist but they're very much not woke <laughs> they're not mm -hmm. politically correct at all so they spent 50, I mean, one of their guys actually died fighting in the street with Nazis. But because one of them said like, I think he said the word retarded, right? In the dock and I left in and someone in America was like, hmm, yeah, they're anti-fascist. I was like, they've spent 15 years fighting in the streets. I mean, look at them all. They've got like flat noses, they're all scarred up. I was like, they spent 15 years fighting against all odds whilst outnumbered. And because he said that word, you are now basically saying everything he stands for is not important. It just sickens me, man. But those those kind of like people are my kind of people. I don't like people that have to walk on eggshells when they mm -hmm. talk or whatever, whatever. And I realized, but they're really, they're funny guys. They mess about, but they're very much disciplined and they believe in what they believe yeah. in. You know, I respect that. I'm like, if you really stand for what you believe and I'm like, you know, in a time where people will just flip flop, I just mm -hmm. think it's very, you know, and they're very, they have this, it's very funny. They have a saying, um, 
Kaferik, which there's no direct translation, but it's basically like good vibes, like get buzzed. It means, yeah, get buzzed, like get high, but not high on drugs, like get high, get fun, have a mm -hmm. buzz. And so all the units in Ukraine, most of them, their, their patch is like, you know, skull and crossbones, a gun. Like that's what war's like, that's what it is. Their patch is this sign, like rock on, and it says Kaferik. And I was like, what is that? And they were kind of a bit embarrassed. I'm like, oh, fuck, you know, and they explained. And I was like, that's the best thing I've ever seen. That to me is like sum them up. They're guys, and when you talk to them, they're like, we don't want to be at war. We don't want to kill. We're not like bloodthirsty. Oh, don't get me wrong. They're like, we want to kill because we want revenge, but they're not like, we don't want this war. And everyone was like, well, like, what were you doing before this? So they were like, just having fun with my friends. And everyone was like, I miss hanging out with my people. You know what I mean? And for me, I was like, that's really important. That's really beautiful. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So for us, it was very easy to represent them. And after that, the re other reason I'm proud of the doc is because so after we've, we've been... Um, screening doing screenings of the documentary like anti-fascist football hooligan uh, sorry anti-fascist football clubs um so we did one in um clapton we did one in saint Pauli, and we're doing one at shamrock rovers in two days in ireland and we donate all of the ticket sales to them because there, there's a misconception so the aid so america gives two billion in aid or 10 billion or whatever it is that doesn't trickle down you know the military get that first obviously they need it first but Hutzut's clan and many, many, many fighters in Ukraine are volunteers. They they weren't military. They weren't, I mean, Anton that runs Hutzut's clan, he worked in a nightclub behind the bar before the war, you know? He did Thai, but they just opened a gym, a Thai boxing gym. So now they're fighting. So they went, hey, we want to defend our country. They unfortunately don't get the same amount of aid. So they get weapons and they get ammunition. Other than that, they have to borrow their own vehicles. They have to, even some of them have had to provide their own winter clothing and that's fucked up <laughs> it is what it yeah. is it, i don't know whose fault it is i don't know if it's anyone's fault and to be honest at war war is expensive so you know it's it's i don't know if it's anyone's fault but it doesn't trickle down so we've been donating all the money to them um and they've been able to buy this that and the other and through that loads of other groups have kind of what i call real anti-fascists not not groups that are on the internet crying like there's the these groups don't have internet accounts <laughs> you know they don't have saint pauli the ultras that we were full, that we did the event with certainly are not on twitter you know what i mean they're i mean about 50 of them got arrested last weekend for, for hooliganism but they without you know without talking to anyone without making a show about it they saint pauli specifically in the first week of the invasion sent 20 tons of aid over the border, uh, you know, got it across for Poland, got it into Ukraine, not just for anti-fascist groups, for everybody, for civilians. So that to me, I'm like, that's beautiful to see that real old school network is still there. And whilst everyone cries on the internet and is arguing, it's like, everyone's like, fuck them. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're still doing our thing, you know? Do you think you'll change it up a bit with the war stuff? Do you mm. think you'll go down a different avenue anytime soon? Yes next year <laughs> so we, we we're starting a new project it's called bando magazine so you know a bando is like the kind of idea was a bando is like a building that's been abandoned and repurposed for like illicit activity or whatever we thought the name worked because it's kind of like we feel like there's a lot of young people particularly in certain scenes that i've mentioned like punks hooligans fucking whatever like shy kids you know people misfits on the outs you know on the on the fringes that have been kind of abandoned by the media. There is no media for them. There is no like, here's a really interesting underground story. If there is, it's always with the caveat of these people are bad. So we're starting this new project, Bando Magazine. We're trying to get investors to do documentaries, but we're starting with a physical magazine first. And essentially we're just saying like, we're reporting from like below. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're like, we're not left, we're not right, we're from below. We're saying like, you know, for example, we got a story about, um, there's like counterfeit, counterfeit drugs now in America. So, you know, you had like oxycodone and then they made a counterfeit of that. And now some reason it's, it's, it's explained in the article, they're now making counterfeit versions of like the counterfeit concoction. And, you know, we sent like one of our writers out to spend a week with the people that are using this. And we don't want to do it in a way that it's like sensational. It's like, whoa, drugs. We're like, hey, look what's destroying the fucking community and who did it the doctors <laughs> you know what i mean actually you know what i mean so stuff like that we got another article like you know spacex like elon musk's yeah. thing they had like a secret party where you had to sign like an nda 
So we sent a guy there and he's like, doesn't give a shit. So he broke his NDA. We'll probably get sued for it, but that'd be good for us. You know, we got our money anyway. We'll probably get the attention. But he went to like a secret SpaceX party and he wrote about it. The weirdest thing, they had like snakes fighting each other. Like the weird, you know, like millionaires that are so bored, they don't know what else to do. So they're just doing the weirdest shit. They were like allocating women to people. Like they were like, we pay for them. You can have one. He's like, what the fuck? Like really fucked up shit. But basically we just want to do stuff like that. We want to be like, hey, like the world is very interesting if you scratch beneath the very boring like sanitized version of things and we want to you know we're kind of we said we're like reporting from the curb but without prejudice and without kind of telling you if it's bad or not like without judgment it's mm -hmm. like if you think that's bad fine <laughs> we don't yeah. give a shit we're not we're not here to tell you what you should think so our new project and like already we've put out stuff and it's very very thank god very quickly people are emailing like how do we get involved how do we get involved and essentially we want to like eat vice's lunch <laughs> to be honest with you like vice has kind of died i think in in the way of its influence um not to say that we want to be them we want to do something completely different vice to me was the cool kids that sneer at like the silly person dancing and then like slyly film it and be like <laughs> Fuck them. We want to be the silly person. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think those people are cool. People that are not scared to be who they are. You know, I think there's a real problem right now with the cool crowds trying to do irony. Oh, it's just being ironic. I'm like, no, you're a fucking coward. You're basically trying to be ironic because you're scared that someone will say that won't work. And then you can just say, oh, I was just joking. We don't like that. We're like, we want to be like, now nah, let's get back to making shit because we think it's cool and we think it's important. And if someone says that's cringe, all right, <laughs> like yeah. it doesn't matter anymore. You know, I want to bring back a culture into reporting that used to be there in the early 90s, early 2000s. Like the reporters that I used to read, the reporters I read to get influenced to be a reporter, I'm like, let's bring that back. You know what I mean? Like Evan Wright, like he was a great influence um, on me. He wrote um, Generation Kill, actually, which is a really good book. He also wrote Hella Nation. And yeah, we just, we just want to do that. We want to bring back like counterculture, but counterculture reporting where it's not like, it's not someone kind of giggling and sneering. We want to just be like, look what's happening. What do you think about it? It's up to you then, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's needed right now. And I think a lot of people are very bored, especially young people, really bored. And there's a reason they're zoning out and spending two weeks watching reality TV instead of consuming what we want them to consume. So we kind of want to be like, hey, they've been abandoned. It's not their fault. There's this thing in the media, like a lot of these big fucking execs I meet, they're like, oh, the youth are just not interested. I'm like, it's your fault they're not interested. You didn't give them what they need. You thought you did but you just brand, you just did branded content for three fucking weeks and you know what I mean? Went on some woke tirade on Twitter and you think that's what people want. People are bored of that. You know what I mean? That 2016 is dead. So we're trying to bring back that kind of counterculture, kind of, you know, brash, kind of no decorum reporting. <laughs> you know mm. what I mean? And it might fail. And like, somebody's like, oh, what if it fails, man? You've got a big profile now. Like, Fuck it, who cares if it fails? We tried. And yeah. someone might be like, ha ha, it failed. Okay, what did you do? You know what I mean? Like when we posted it, someone was like, this is going to fail. I said, what have you created today? You know what I mean? Like, what did you do? Yeah. If it's nothing, fuck off. And if it fails, it's okay. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I feel like, don't get me wrong, popular front. Like I started it all myself and it's all going well. It's going really well. Like we, you know, there's been no like major failures. Like, thank God. But I don't want to get too comfortable with that. It's like, you should always try and then go like, okay, everything I, I know this i know war i know what i'm doing there with the war i know it back of my hand maybe i'll try something else and yeah you know, like it might fail but mm -hmm. fuck it man where can people get in contact with all that stuff instagram youtube i think the best way um if they go to um our instagram so that's just at popular dot front and mm -hmm. you'll see everything we're about there but to be honest to get a better idea of it the youtube is the best place so popular uh, youtube.com slash popular front as we spoke about before we're getting censored the fuck on there they're putting everything behind an age restriction just because we don't want to, we, I don't, we, I refuse to sanitize the content for the sake of a YouTube algorithm. You know what I mean? It's just pathetic. I don't go to war to then be like, uh oh, I hope Susan at fucking YouTube is happy with this. That's just not right, you know, and it's not what YouTube was about. But yeah, youtube.com slash popular front, that's the best way. Me, um, if you go to my website, Jake Hanrahan, H A N R A H A N dot com. You just get links to everything. That's the easiest way. Where do you go for the future, then, brother? You've just touched on a few things there, but what else? Yeah. You got? Well, I wanna, I wanna go, I wanna go to um, back to Ukraine, and I wanna do something different there again. But I also I wanna go to Armenia report on that I, to carry on doing the like underreported stories back to back to Palestine I want to do something there with Popular Front because we've not done anything I was with Vice when I did Palestine stuff so that and again just building up this 
I want to build like a movement with this thing I've got, this Bando magazine idea. Like I want to build a movement rather than just um, like like media. I want it to be like, I, I really want to, you know, the kind of, like I said, the shy kids, the misfits, I want it to be like, hey, come and sit with us. <laughs> you know, I want to I create that vibe. Um, and I hope that's what I can do. Mm -hmm. For anybody that's maybe watching and struggle right now, brother, what advice would you have for them? Man, that's a good question, man. Actually, if you don't mind, I'd just like to mention like a very good friend of mine actually like uh, like committed suicide like a few years Sorry ago. Sorry, it's, it's something. Brother. Yeah, man. It, thank you. It, it's brutal. Um, and it, it, it like that is a great question because that's not enough. People aren't asking that enough. I think <sighs> advice. I would just say I tell this to other. You know, like when like me and my my close friends like it, it's. I, I understand that it's hard for like it is hard still for men to talk about it. But like I think you need a small group of friends <clears throat> that you trust i think and like don't even if you feel awkward like it's fine you know what i mean and i think like the friends i have like that that i talk to like i always say to them like everything's temporary it will get better like it will like even if it's it might be worse again but there's always a time when it will blow over whatever's happening will happen there's always an option i know it's easier said than done but fucking hell that it is true you know mm -hmm. what i mean um I think it's very difficult to say right now, especially in this country, the 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 cost of living has just gone crazy. Like people that are living on the on the kind of breadline, it's just I, I don't think I, I don't think people realise outside of the country or even outside of working class communities how bad it is. It's unbelievable. Like I know people that are using candles instead because they've got a fucking prepaid meter and they can't afford it, you know what I mean? Um, but I would say again, like everything will pass. You know what I mean? Everything will pass, man. Like it's just, it's hard, man. But I guess like struggle makes you tough, you know, it makes yeah. you strong. And I, one thing I'd just like to say as well before, like the thing that I say to everyone is get involved with the gym and combat sports. And that's not to be macho and tough. That's because you will meet the best community you've ever met there. Independent combat sports gyms, like kind of like definitely saved my life. You know what I mean? And I, I think there's some great communities still doing stuff um there's a great there's actually there's a great just just last thing i will say there's a great group right now in manchester called uh 0161 manchester and it's like a working class solidarity group um and they're doing like amazing stuff if there were more groups like that people helping each other rather than trying to tell people off and you know whatever i think that would be a, you know mm. <laughs> the country would be better yeah. off you know? before we finish up yeah nine angles i see you talk about angles. yeah what Those was nutters, that man yeah Bro. satanists and shit mm. It's the sort. It's the one thing. So I'm very. Careful. Everybody goes down that rabbit hole when Satanists and oh, all that, that stuff. I don't, but, I don't like it. But, but, I'm but yeah, but it, yeah. Like, what was the nine angles kind of thing? So the order of nine angles is, it's a group that sounds too good to be true, which is very real. So it's it's a, a militant satanic, like neo-Nazi occult order, which sounds like the craziest mouthful you've ever heard. But I've been I've been like researching it for like over ten years probably now, and I'm still a bit like, what is it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Essentially, they believe in human sacrifice. It was started here in Britain, and people, are, you know, they've influenced several. There's been several Order of Nine Angle killings across the world now, especially in the last five years. There was two human sacrifices in Russia last year. They actually caught the people for it, um, and it's it's one of them ones where, you know, it sounds too good to be true. But I always say to people, the British government the last I heard were actually considering prescribing them as a terrorist group. That's how serious they are. You know what I mean? They influenced a lot of like militant neo-Nazi groups. There's a new level of neo-Nazism now that it's not jackboots and like skinheads. It's like, <clears throat> excuse me. It's like, it's like black metal, long hair, <laughs> like the opposite, like, like sacrifice, like, you know, like burning shit in the woods, like a very, it's like what they call it, like esoteric Hitlerism. They believe that Hitler was like a kind of occult deity. Man, it sounds, I sound insane talking about it, but trust me, it is real. Like it's a very real thing. Um, there was two murders in this country in the last three years, which were directly linked to a guy. Well, the guy that did it was Order of Nine Angles and he was influenced by their beliefs. And essentially what they believe is there's no such thing as morals. If you kind of remove yourself from right and wrong, you can like ascend and be like almost like a, a new person, like a new human being. You can be like evolve into this like, I don't know, like evil person. <laughs> it sounds, I don't know why you'd want to, but they believe in all this power, you know? Jake. Come Thanks, on it, Dave, Brown, That's a story. very weird way to end it. Yeah, no, mate. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, mate. You Give people nightmares, why not, mate? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. I wish you all the best for the future, mate. And uh, keep doing amazing work, brother. Cheers, mate. God Appreciate bless you. It, Thanks so much.